I'd like to call the meeting to order. <clears throat> this meeting is being recorded. Seeing no one else recording this meeting, if you'd please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice, justice for all. <clears throat> Seeing no citizens to comment, I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Hanfield to start us off with the budget presentations. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, happy holidays to all of you out in uh, the viewing audience tonight. Um, as uh, Chairman Scobie said tonight, we are uh, beginning part one of what will be part two, um, or um, excuse me, uh, part one of what will be two parts. Um, relative to budget discussion for fiscal year 22. Um, this evening, we will be hearing from uh, principals and departments uh, regarding um, things going on in their schools right now, uh, as well as what they hope to accomplish in uh, fiscal year 22. Obviously, with things being as they are right now with COVID, um, presentation is going to look a little bit different uh, this evening, as you can already tell. Uh, this evening, principals will only be talking about what's going on in their schools. Um, we have uh, made a decision that we will be level funding our supply line items um, for fiscal year 22, given the understanding that we are facing a very, very lean year. Um, for people that are watching at home, um, the presentation uh, that uh, we will be giving uh, is in slideshow format uh, on our website, so you're welcome to go there and follow along. Um, but uh, other than that, I think we are ready to go. So that being said, as we always do in the Auburn Public Schools, uh, our uh, budgets are created based on best opportunities for our children, and it's guided by our mission, uh, vision, and core values. Our mission is strengthening connections through rigor, relevance, and relationships. The vision is to educate and prepare students for the opportunities and challenges of a changing world. And our core values on the acronym of SHARED, our core values are student-centered decision-making, high expectations for all, having all environments be safe and respectful, responding to needs based on data, providing equity for our students, and we are always dedicated to continuous improvement. So just to uh, respond to people, um, or respond, excuse me, to, um, bless you, Gil. Um, so just to uh, kind of open uh, the presentation, I wanted to just kind of let people know that the theme is really uh, what we're calling response and recovery in unprecedented times. Um, I think it goes without saying that uh, currently, um, toward, since the end of last year and, and through the fiscal year um, of 21, we are responding to COVID. Uh, and the timeline, just to remember um, for people, March 13th, 2020, uh, we were closed due to coronavirus. Uh, we did respond the very best we could given the sudden nature of the changes. It was extremely difficult for everybody involved. Uh, we sent, spent the summer sorting through all kinds of information um, to get ready for a return to school in the fall. We uh, created a comprehensive reopening guide to help guide our uh, transition back into school. And we had a lot of teacher professional development that continues. Um, focused on teaching in a virtual environment. We returned to school September the 21st and October the 5th, 2020, we reopened in a hybrid model. And so right now we are educating our students in what we're calling the pandemic era because truly that's what it is. Uh, it's a paradigm shift in what school looks like and, and what it feels like to staff students and families. Um, we are getting a handle on academic gaps that may be uh, in existence at all levels. We're also focused on the social and emotional state of our students. And um, we are pushing forward to identify these gaps while also introducing new material to the best of our ability, while at the same time addressing social and emotional, emotional concerns of our students. There was an impact uh, regarding COVID onto the budget. On June 2nd of 2020, the fiscal year budget um, was passed uh, for 21. At that time, it was $27,676,055. July 1, 2020, the new fiscal year began 
without certified and local revenue. And so we scaled our budget back to the FY20 appropriated number of $26,934,157, which represented at that time a 2.75% cut. Um, once the revenue was confirmed for FY21 later in the summer, uh, we had $150,000 added back in to the operating budget by town administration, for which we were grateful. We also um, were able to capitalize on a couple of health premium holidays in FY21. Um, that town administration um, allowed another 130,000 into our operating budget. So the revised FY21 number um, was $27,214,157 for approval. And when all is said and done, uh, this number demonstrated a decrease of $461,898 for fiscal year 21. That shortfall uh, primarily uh, was consisted of the state not funding the Student Opportunities Act. They didn't fund it for anybody. Um, and it was also uh, comprised of um, slightly lower than expected town revenue at $42,800. So how did we uh, address that, that shortfall? We were fortunate that we had federal and state grant monies in FY21 uh, to offset shortfall. and. Um, assist with the incredible costs associated with operating schools during the COVID pandemic. We received a $159,000 personal protective equipment and supplies grant um, to help keep staff, staff and students adequately protected and spaces clean. We also received a $225 per child grant, uh, which amounted to $562,000, again, to offset costs of remote instruction, which we used for laptop computers, hotspots, cameras, iPads, software, communication platforms and infrastructure upgrades. We used it also for teacher professional development. We used it to address HVAC costs and potential concerns, as well as any additional busing needs uh, we would have because of the pandemic. The APS also received $240,000 from the Towns Municipal Cares Act money to help with additional HVAC costs, remote instruction costs, and food service expenditures. And it's important to note that um, when you total up those dollars, um, it seems that it does far exceed our original appropriation, which it does. Um, however, those are, are one-time only monies uh, that can be used in FY21. And as everything goes right now, there's tremendous uncertainty as to what FY FY22 will bring, um, especially with uh, a new administration taking over, the timing of that, um, and what the exact nature um, you know, of what state and local revenues will be moving into FY22. Looking forward to 22, in addition to kind of some of the uncertainties, we're looking at FY22 as being the recovery year, or at least starting the recovery uh, in the Auburn Public Schools. Um, as vaccines are starting to come forward, we're still not out of the woods. I imagine that we will be in a much better place um, at this time a year from now. Um, but we will still have plenty of catch-up work to do in the schools. We do anticipate a full return to school in fall 2022. Uh, we anticipate continuing to deal with the impact COVID has had on students academically and psychologically for the foreseeable future. Tonight, you'll hear from our department heads and principals, and again, they'll be presenting uh, what they expect to accomplish this year um, as we are responding. COVID and then they will discuss a little bit about what they hope to be uh, doing next year as we start to recover hopefully from COVID. Um, as I've said a number of times probably since October FY22 promises to be a very lean budget year. Uh, there are no new positions in this coming year's budget. Uh, we would only be looking to do that if an emergent situation arose that had to do with a child's programming or a potential class size issue. Uh, as I already stated, our classroom supply lines are level funded. Um, they are attached on the back of this uh, if people are interested in looking at that. And um, what we're really trying to do is seek um, maintenance of our current staffing levels because that really is what's going to put us um, in a position to bring our children forward academically and socially and emotionally. Um, it's critical that we hold on to the current staff that we have. So we are moving forward in that uh, in that frame and um, we will see where this goes so tonight's part one the order of presentations um, is included here uh, and then part two will be January 6th on January 6th I will speak with you as will Cecilia and Dr. Chamberlain 
more about the meat of the budget, real, you know, things like Medicaid, um, things like school choice, other offsets that we use, uh, anticipated costs that we may be having relative to, you know, fuel and oil and, and those things, transportation, special education. But that's a much longer conversation that will definitely go beyond the scope of tonight's discussion. So tonight's the overview of what's going on in the schools, and then we'll talk about the dollars and cents um, and have a draft number for you January 6th as we are required to have a draft number two town hall by the second Monday in January. And we're definitely on track to do that. So um, without any further ado, um, order of presentations is Dr. Chamberlain. So she is up first. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to be here tonight with all of you. Um, certainly with Dr. Hanfield, and it's nice to see a few members of the leadership team, and they'll be uh, coming in as the evening goes on. So we're happy to have them here. Um, and it's interesting because tonight a lot of what you'll hear will be similar to years past and some is going to be very different, right? Um, and as you know, our primary focus this year and the work I've done this year is really began around the safe reopening of schools um, to make sure that our students and staff were safe. And I, I think we've done this, right? Nothing is perfect, but we have done a lot of things very well, I think, for that opening. Um, and that's in large part due to the folks you're going to hear from tonight on the leadership team. Um, all of you for the support you've given us throughout and the guidance and understanding you've shared with us, um, along with every member of our school community, right? The teachers, the, the custodial staff, secretaries, um, instructional staff. We couldn't have done it um, without everybody, as I keep saying, rowing in the right direct, same direction. So together, um, we spent a lot of time with the return to school team at the start of the year that created that plan for reentry. Um, and I would be remiss if I don't give a shout out to the school nursing team and the Auburn Board of Health. Uh, Darlene Coyle and Eileen Alexander have been instrumental in guiding us through this process. Um, I speak with them nearly every day and they never turn my calls away <laughs> and they are patient and thorough. Um, and the, the nurses working with them have just been remarkable. So. It's just been a really rewarding experience for me and I think for them as well, but it's, it's in due in large part to them that we've made it um, uh, this far in the school year. You know, I want to uh, just compliment too, um, I helped to facilitate some work our guidance team did uh, throughout the summer, reaching out to students who we knew might be at risk. I don't know if you've seen in the paper recently but and on the news that many children are struggling with social emotional concerns. And that still continues to be a, a priority for us this year. But that began very early. That began back in June when we started reaching out to kids. Um, and thankfully, our guidance team was willing to do so. So that social emotional need has never come off our radar. Um, we have work to do, but it's always been a priority. Uh, throughout this summer and uh, this year, we continue to make opportunities for teachers to learn with one another and from one another. Uh, the last time I met with you, I talked about the professional development that hap had happened recently. Those things are ongoing and happen uh, very regularly on our Wednesday afternoons and the professional development days that, that we continue to have. Um, this year, under Dr. Hanfield's leadership, we begin our social justice committee, which is comprised of teachers and students and staff, uh, recognizing that we're living in a climate that's changed not only from COVID, right, but the social um, social justice issues that have been raised during this time have really um, touched all of us. And this has been taken seriously and will carry, carry forward into the coming year as we work to really welcome the diversity that, that we have in our district. Um, this year I also resumed my role as principal of the preschool, which is, I will tell you, some of the best part of my day, even though I love my job. Um, but some of those little kids, they just don't get any cuter than that, honestly. Um, it's worked out really beautifully, I think, that our kids have been able to come in every day, five days a week, albeit for a half day. Um, but the preschool kids have been in every day, and it's really helped to establish a routine for them, and they've done very well. And um, it, it's just been wonderful to see them, particularly because we get students right from early intervention, and many of them have special needs that are best addressed the earlier the better, right? So that's, that's worked out quite yeah, well. A quick question about how many students are we talking about? Um, right now we have about uh, 54 students, I want to say. Not all special needs, obviously, but some are. Um, we've tried to create a nice inclusive environment for them. Good. But yeah, so they're able to receive their services. They do a lot of outside playtime, um, a lot of inside work. You know, the kids are just, they're, they're happy. 
they they acclimate, I think, much easier than the adults do. Um, but yeah, I was in a class the other day, and they were all separated. They all had their own little thing, but they were chatting with one another, and it was, it, it seemed very normal, you know. Um, so it's it's gone quite well. Thank you. Uh, so in the coming year, so whether we want to admit to it or not, I think we've learned a lot this year. <laughs> um, we've learned a lot about what technology can do for us. We've learned a lot about what kids can maybe do a little bit more on their own than they might have in school. I think we've learned some, some new teaching strategies, some new learning strategies. Um, and I hope that we can carry some of that, certainly not all of it, but some of it into next year. And it's going to make us a better school community because of it. Um, this will also tie in, Dr. Hanfield mentioned, the idea of focusing on response to intervention. You know, our kids did not have a typical school experience from last March. So some kids are going to need some help. They're going to need some catching up, and we're going to need to be able to identify that. Even though we're already doing some of that this year, it's just different, right? So we hope that when we can get back to normal, we can really structure that in a way that we can move kids forward. The Social Justice Committee is going to continue. We're already waiting for um, some information to provide some uh, outside professional development work to come and help us along with that. Social justice learning can be a very sensitive topic. We want to make sure that we use experts in this area to guide us along um, because there's no one in the district that can't learn more about that, um, you know, from bottom to top. So. We are investigating that now so we can start off the school year with some training in that area. Professional development. So this year, professional development's been a little different, right? We can't have a lot of outside people, but we are discussing, um, Dr. Hanfield and I, about making it a bit more individualized if we can um, to really, you know, we want to meet children's needs where they are as learners, and I think we need to try and find a way to do that for our teachers as well. Um, respecting the boundaries we have around financial limitations and all of that. But I think we can work something out that might be um, amenable to the teachers to really make it more uh, individualized for them. And again, we always come back to the social and emotional well-being of our kids. Um, you know, this year we do have Bright in our schools, but it's not up and running as it was even last year. So we have to go back and we have to reboot that. Um, you know, last March when we left, we had started a reboot of co-teaching. Co-teaching looks very different this year. It's, it's because of the limitations we have. But that's an important initiative, and we have to get back to that. So that's another thing that we'll revisit, along with that social and emotional screener that um, we, we will use with kids next year. And we want more kids in our preschool. It's great right now, but we want those <laughs> rooms full. We want kids full day. So we're going to focus on doing that uh, as well. So while this year has been a year like no other, as Auburn always does, we've put our best foot forward. And we'll continue to do that. We continue to push on getting better. Um, and I welcome any questions you might have. Any questions for Dr. Chandler? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, <coughs> thank you, Dr. Chamberlain. Uh, Mrs. Reedy, are you there? <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Reedy. Welcome. You are going to be the first virtual presenter tonight. Welcome. <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Good evening. It's great to see all of you as we kick off our fiscal year 22 budget. So the Pupil Services Department is extremely thankful for our special education staff across the district. They've really dug in and are providing our students with really robust learning opportunities, both in person and remotely. So some of the accomplishments for this year, um, our Encore program was able to open this September at Central Office. Um, that works with our uh, students who are age 18 to 22, and we actually call them associates, not students. Um, they receive instruction in daily living skills, self-determination, interpersonal, and employment skills. We're really fortunate at this time that they were able to participate in person at a few work sites, but they have numerous vocational jobs within the district that they're providing uh, support for at this time. So it's really, it's, it's hit the ground running and it's um, really exciting to see the kids and the growth that they've made so far. This summer through our extended school year program, we started off very slowly. Um, we had eight students back in person with many, many safety precautions in place, but families and students were thrilled to start students back into that school setting. 
Since mid-September, we've been able to provide in-person programming four of four and a half days a week to our high-need students. This has had such a positive impact on their learning thus far. We also recently started using a digital and remote assessment platform for our assessors to enable our staff to administer special education eligibility testing remotely. And so far, it's going well. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has a new set of dyslexia guidelines that they are releasing very shortly. I was fortunate to be a part of that working committee for them. Here in Auburn, we already have a number of really good things in place. And so I'll be working with our special ed staff and others to review and make any needed revisions to ensure with that we're meeting, but also exceeding these guidelines for our students with dyslexia. And I'm hopeful that in the spring, we might be able to host some type of unified school day games with our Auburn school community. We did have one scheduled for last May, um, but as we all know, things changed. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to do something like that, but it will be, of course, will be dependent on the current health situation. In the fall, Auburn was named a unified champion school district, which means all of our schools have been deemed unified champion schools for their inclusive sports, inclusive youth leadership opportunities, and whole school engagement. So we are extremely proud of everyone for that. So some of the expected accomplishments that we're looking uh, to for fiscal year 22, hopefully when things are back to normal, Dr. Chamberlain and I will work together to review our co-teaching practices across the district and refine them as needed. We're also hopeful to have some of our own folks from within the district become co-teaching coaches to build some capacity and provide support for our co-teaching teams. With the support of our transition coordinator vocational coach, students in the high school will have job shadowing experiences and internship opportunities within the town of Auburn. As Dr. Chamberlain talked about, our bright programs at the middle school and high school will continue to provide that much needed support for students who struggle with social emotional needs and we feel that will be much more needed even in the coming year. Again, Dr. Chamberlain and I will work together with Dr. Lopez to look at social emotional needs of the students at Swanson Road to determine if any needed additional supports uh, need to be in place there. And finally, as a special ed department, we'll transition to writing standards-based goals and objectives that will align more closely with our state education standards. So I thank you for your time this evening. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Any questions for? Ms. I just have one about how many associates are currently coming into um, our our building for. Uh, advanced classes core program we currently yes. have four students four. we have four students and i have to just toot our horn a little bit um we meet you know frequently with um dds and with some other agencies and they're really asking us if we're looking to uh quite possibly tuition some students in they're very impressed with our program and how we're running it so that's something i think that you know we'd love to be able to talk about in the future maybe be able to um tuition some students in from other districts who um you know might benefit from our our programming so it's really it's really taken off really well even in the times that we are in it's um it's really a, a bright spot good thank you thank you any other comments or questions? I'll just say thank you for that report, Rosemary. Um, just like Dr. Chamberlain, um, in these uncertain and difficult times, you, you both present um, a lot of the positives that are happening in our schools. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosemary. I appreciate it. Um, up next is uh, Mr. Joseph Fahey, our Director of Facilities. Good evening, Mr. Fahey. Good evening, Dr. Hanfield. Good evening, everybody. Hope all is well. Um, as, as you'll hear from everyone, a lot going on. So I'm going to get right started with my bullets. And what we have done since March has been pretty heroic by our uh, custodial team uh, with the support of all of you. Uh, what we've done is um, at our high school, we installed a new bathroom and preschool rooms. Um, on the first floor, uh, started those right in March to get them ready. Um, what we also did was we relocated the art room and installed a spray booth along with uh, 
uh, kiln exhaust system uh, up on the third floor for our new art uh, classroom. We completed phase one of the electrical gear um, change out. What we, um, we experienced some, um, some water that leaked into our main switch gear, which would like to uh, be a little bit proactive in this one. So uh, it's a two part system. We're hoping to complete the project during Christmas break. We also, through our capital program, we're in the process of, again, over December break, replacing our exterior doors and some interior doors at our high school um, through our capital program. We um, am proud to say that we completed our solar projects uh, at both the middle school and the high school. Um, we're still collecting the data on actually how much we're actually savings, but I can tell you through my, my dashboard that uh, because of the CO2 emissions that we've saved, we've technically would have had to plant um, 4,273 trees at the middle school and um, 3,365 trees at our high school. So there's a little jeopardy question for you all. Um, also, what we've done too is we started phase one at Bryn Mawr as far as the sprinkler, um, uh, a sprinkler upgrade which um, started uh, when school actually got out in um, early March, we procured that. So at least we have the water going into the building. The next phase will be um, installed in the classrooms. We replaced the interior glass panels, which was a pretty big job that we did it in-house with our own guys to, uh, uh, to again, move forward with our sprinkler project. At our kitchen, uh, here at Central Office, we uh, we did some major upgrades to support uh, Mrs. Reedy's program that she's very proud of, the Encore program, uh, which they seem to be working out pretty well. Um, we also, um, through um, through all the CARES Act and the, the money that's allotted to the town, we're able to purchase these bipolarization uh, portable um, uh, air purifiers, which um, I'm happy to say they're actually being uh, shipped as we speak. So they'll be eventually in, going into our classrooms very shortly. Uh, and since the start of this pandemic, we've done interior, exterior painting. Our buildings here at West Street was recently painted uh, in the summer. And the last bullet is, is the bullet I'm most proud of is through our custodial team, is we, we enrolled them in an in a, in a online class called Hilliard University. And, and I gotta tell you, all these guys are uh, uh, magna cum laude in my eyes because uh, <laughs> what we've done is uh, we not only did online training on how to prepare for this, this um, pandemic, but um, they took it to heart. And these guys really uh, invested themselves in. They still came to work every day. Um, they're, they're, they're proud. They're proud of what they're doing. And I got to tell you that um, the products that we've been using are the same products that we've been using all along. So that's very comforting to know that we're not putting more VOCs into our classrooms. We're using pretty much the same products that we've been using over the years. And um, during when this thing first started out, everyone's going crazy looking for different products, different um, atomization tools to use, um, victory spray guns. We, we've purchased these things over the years. So um, nice to know that we have the products, we have the technology, our guys are using them, and um, our, our buildings are being clean. So that's a lot that's been accomplished this past year, and looking forward to the expected accomplishments will be uh, continue with our training um, to complete the switch gear project at the high school, which again is gonna happen during um, Christmas break. We're also um, upgrading our HV system at Swanson Road in both gyms through the Green Community Grant Program that we have along with our capital projects. Uh, so that will happen probably in, in February. Um, in, we put off this project at Bryn Mawr School which was gonna be upgraded to main electrical coming into the building. Uh, we had to wait for some easements which we were just approved at a town meeting. So that's gonna be uh, going underway. Uh, so along with the completion of the sprinkler systems in the classrooms at Bryn Mawr, 
And we held off on this project last year, um, which was to resurface the tennis courts um, over at Derry Square at our high school. And lastly, um, on the dockets is to replace the oil tank at the intermediate school. So uh, we're not letting this COVID stop us. So we're, we're moving forward and um, we're proud to be the facility director of, of, of your schools. So I thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, Joe. Any questions for Mr. Fain? Just a comment. You have kept us ahead of the curve. Thank you so much, Joe. It's, it's been fantastic. Come, but again, it's it's you know takes a village, and you know what we're, we're certainly a village, and as Dr. Chamberlain was saying about the Board of Health, they are they're second to none, uh, and you know we're lucky we're lucky here in Auburn, We've got a pretty good village. So I thank you, Dr. Hanfield. I thank you all. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for the report. Tell um, tell you guys thank you for us yeah. as well, all your whole staff I should say. Yeah, you've kept those schools so clean this time, you know, and never would have had a doubt, but thank you so much. Thanks, Joe, very much. Um, appreciate it. Next up is uh, our Director of Technology, Mr. Bouvier. Hi, Eric, how are you? Good, good evening. How's everyone doing? Okay. Great. Uh, welcome to my home. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. You may... Yeah, you may see an animal pass by. I can't make any promises, but um, I was just gonna say, getting good the at the Zoom bombing. That, I was just going to say this is the first conversation that we've had where people are unmasked on the other side. <laughs> yeah. Not, not used to that, so. <laughs> well, um, it's been, uh, oddly enough, a pretty exciting year for technology in the Auburn Public Schools. <laughs> You know, despite everything that's been going on, we've had a really good year and we've made a lot of progress. And we came into this crisis in a really good position to be able to provide our students with the technology and the support they need to succeed through remote learning. So, yeah, it's a testament to school committee and administration and everyone that works for the Auburn Public Schools that we had the devices to be able to do what we did, which was provide every student in the Auburn Public Schools with an iPad that they could take home and remote learn with. So uh, we're very proud of that, and we are um, looking forward to uh, continuing with that as we move forward. But that was just one small thing we did uh, this year. Uh, and a lot of it is uh, thanks to the support we've gotten through grants and other, other sources of income, we've been able to very quickly move the district forward with technology in, in a way that we never would have been able to do if, if we weren't in this crisis. Uh, prior to the start of this school year, uh, we had decided that we were going to purchase new iPads for every sixth and eighth grade student in, in the district. That was to replace the iPads that they were currently using that had been purchased with the building. So they were, they had, they had come as part of the middle school building project. They were aging. They needed to be replaced. We did not buy seventh grade this year because we had purchased those the previous. So uh, our plan was to go into the school year with every student having an iPad that was either one years old or brand new. Uh, that was very fortuitous because we were able to take those iPads that we were re pooping from that from our students and then turn those around very quickly and get them to students at Bryn Mawr and Packet Park. So if we hadn't had that planned, we wouldn't have been able to provide the, uh, the devices to all of those students. It worked out really well. Um, I'd like to say that's just how we planned it, but it, it you know, it, it wasn't, but we, we, we were able to, uh, we were able to make it work. We we're also able to give every teacher, pre-K to 12, and, and much of our staff knew iPads this year. Uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was a response in part to COVID, but again, something that we had planned. We had planned to purchase new iPads for the entire middle and high school teaching staff this year. And, and we had already purchased those before the, well, yeah, just at the end of last year. So um, it was in the works, but we were able to expand that to every teacher. So every teacher, preschool through 12th grade, has or is in the process of receiving a new iPad right now. Uh, but that wasn't it. 
we were also able to give every teacher preschool through 12 a new laptop, which was actually a, a pretty amazing accomplishment and not one that we had planned on at all prior to COVID. It was apparent when we, um, when COVID started that we were gonna have to replace some computers. So we initially decided we were going to replace, uh, we we're gonna provide iPads to all teaching staff that didn't have them. The only teaching staff that did were Swanson in the middle school, but we were able to do that. And then we were able to, to expand that process to then replace the, the laptops at Swanson in the middle school, which again, were purchased for the building project. So they were six years old and in the need of replacing. So it worked out really well. Um, again, gave every kid in this district an iPad, which was a tremendous accomplishment and um, one that I think many districts are still struggling to, to get through to be, be able to provide devices to all of their students. Uh, we, we were able to do it. It was a very time consuming and, and stressful process to get them to kids in the middle of a pandemic. but. I, I, I can't say enough about our administration and our teaching staff that came and gave up their time. Um, teachers from all of our schools that came and helped collect iPads when we had to collect them and distribute them to, to students that were coming to get them, um, which was an amazing thing to, to see, despite all the circumstances we were going through. Uh, for Mrs. Stanick's staff stood out in the pouring rain. I, I've never seen it rain that hard. <laughs> and we were, um, we were handing out iPads. Uh, on top of that, another big accomplishment here was the implementation of Seesaw for our pre-K to two. Some, and now we've expanded it to, uh, to some um, special classrooms at the middle and high school as well. So we had, we knew we had Schoology and Google Classroom as learning platforms for our, for our grades three through 12, but we didn't have anything K to two. So we quickly made the decision uh, to move forward with Seesaw. And I think it's been a pretty big success at those schools. Uh, everyone seems to be really happy with it, which is um, terrific. Uh, geez, the, the things just keep going. Um, Zoom was another one of those big ones that we, we weren't going to do, but um, circumstances made us uh, pivot and we were able to bring in Zoom. And despite some initial you know, fun that occurred in some of the rooms, we, we've gotten really good at, at locking it down and protecting our students. And um, right now it, it's an integral part of what we're doing for pre-K uh, pre all the way through 12th grade. We expanded the use of a program called Nearpod to grades three through 12. Private, uh, previously, it was only in the high school. Nearpod essentially is a program that lets you use a PowerPoint-like presentation and turn it into an interactive uh, lesson so that teachers can require student input, give them assignments to do within the, within the um, presentation, allow them to work collaboratively, put them in virtual field trips so that they can they can experience those together. It's a really wonderful tool uh, and it's been really helpful as we've gone through this. It, it's one of those tools that al actually allows students at home and in the classroom to work and collaborate together. So it's a, it's a good experience for them. We, through the help uh, of a Department of Ed grant, we purchased and have been distributing hotspots to families that are having uh, any issues at home so that they don't fall behind on remote learning yeah anytime anyone comes to us for any reason that tells us that they that they have an internet issue to deal with we're able to provide them with a hotspot and, and solve that for them so that's been great we replaced all the computers in the auburn high school computer-aided design lab again this was something that had been planned previously but it was a uh, a good step forward those computers need to be replaced regularly because computer-aided design is a pretty powerful piece of software and it requires strong computers to run it. We distributed webcams to teachers in grades K to 2 so that they could do um, some check-in and enhance remote learning with some more face-to-face -face, um, time with their students, which has been a success. We implemented Adobe Creative Cloud at the high school because we had a group of students that were doing video production and graphics that had no way to remote learn on those without being physically in our room. But by providing them with Creative Cloud licenses, 
they could they could access that content to a small degree on their iPads and a greater degree on computers if they have them at home. Uh, and this one blows my mind so much so I checked it four times to make sure I had the number right. But we've responded to over 2,100 support tickets since July 1, which still is amazing to me. And um, it was a real tough time in uh, September <laughs> and <laughs> August. But, um, and I think a lot of those came through those. And, um, and that's, not, that's not the phone calls. That's not the emails that were sent directly to us. But we've gotten our community really used to submitting support tickets so that we can track the amount of, of work that we're doing. We can refer back to them, and it allows whoever's submitting us with the ticket to be able to um, follow the progress of it. So uh, it's an astounding number. And, again, I checked it again today because I didn't think it could possibly be right, but it absolutely is. So um, that's, that's a testament to, um, to everybody. That's not just my staff supporting those. That's the principals of schools and the assistant principals at the schools who are handing out replacing iPads or broken, replacing broken cords and cases. Everybody's, everyone's a part of that. So um, it, it's really a good, good thing to, to see. It's a, it's a strong team we have. Um, so that's a lot of accomplishments, um, I think. You know, nobody, and I don't I feel like those are some really um, – very good things and we couldn't have done it without a lot of support from everybody as we look at next year we've accomplished so much this year it, you know you look at next year and it, it's a little difficult to see you know where do we go from here but i think really what we have to focus on as a, as a district is what are the lessons that we're, we're learning from remote learning right now what are, what are the things that are valuable that that we can continue how can we take this situation we're in and make us a better school district as as a result of it. Our teachers are learning some great skills. Everybody, all of a sudden, has to use technology. Even those that didn't want to use it in the past have no op no, no options now. It, it has to be. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of growth in our teachers and their technology skills, and they're doing things that I don't think they ever thought they would be doing. Mm -hmm. And it's on us to make sure that that continues into the next year. Some of the things that we had to put aside this year, uh, we look to do next year. We really did want to um, review our high school and middle school iPad program, put together a group of teachers and really dig into the depths of policies and procedures and how we do things. And, and of course, correct, it's been a few years since we do, we've done that. And the iPads have changed and our students have changed and our teachers have changed. So it, it's going to be an important thing to do next year. We want to continue to support student data privacy. That's an important thing for us to make sure that our student data is kept secure, both in district and by the software packages that we we contract with to, uh, to provide services to our students. So that's a, that's a pretty big project. It, it means really digging into every software relationship we have that stores student data and ensuring that it's being kept adequately. It's not being sold for commercial purposes. So um, when you get right down to the vast number of programs and applications we're using, it, it's a significant a significant task, but well worth doing. Um, I think we have to prepare for a permanent one-to-one -one program in the Auburn Public Schools, because I don't know how we pull that back at this point. Um, and that's exciting. I think we, we obviously have the, the equipment to be able to ensure that every kid has a device in their hands, at least while they're in school, whether they go home or not. That's, that's a conversation we'll, we'll have to have and, and we will have, but um, that's going to bring up some, some things, some, some, some capacity issues and some things we're just gonna have to consider, but it's an exciting thing. Um, continue to promote di digital citizenship. That's a constant thing that we want to do and it's always changing how, um, how our students need to be online and in the digital world. We want to increase technology integration activities throughout the district. We always want to do that. And now we have a whole slew of new tools that we're going to be able to use. Um, further, the integration of Seesaw into our K-2 schools. How is that going to look when it's not fully remote? But um, I think it, it really has a strong place and we'll continue to utilize it. And we want to continue to consolidate our resources to minimize duplication. 
And that really comes out nowadays in remote learning when everybody's at home and, and, and a lot of, there's a lot of independence going on to make sure that we're not, we don't have multiple programs getting at the same aim um, so that we're on board. Everyone's, everyone's going in the same direction. Nothing is worse than when you're a parent and you, you don't know where to go to find something because this teacher uses this program, this teacher uses that program. It's kept this way in another thing really aligning what we do and ensuring that everybody's pointed in the same direction and everybody knows where to find it. So uh -huh. those are what we hope to do next year for the first time in a long time. It doesn't involve buying a bunch of stuff, you know, because <laughs> we're in a really good place right now. So, um, and that's exciting. Any questions? I have, I have two questions, Eric. My first one is, how many people are in your department to help you? It's a department right now. Two of them are working fully remote. Okay. Our data district data manager is fully remote, and our technical support person is fully remote, which has worked out really well because she's able to respond to a lot of those tickets that way. So we have three people that have been physically in the district through this. Okay, thank you. At one time, I think you had to do it all alone, so that's why I was asking. <laughs> yeah. And my other question is, what happens to all the computers and laptops that we decide are obsolete? Is there some way to donate them or? Um, we, by the time we're done with them, there's not a whole lot that, that we do. We, we generally offer some to youth and family services, but there's not, um, there's not a lot that we can, uh, they don't really take any. So in most cases, we uh, safely just, just um, have a company come out, they take them, they destroy the data and, um, it doesn't end up costing the district anything, which is, it becomes more important. I think we, um, we get rid of them safely and securely and uh, at no cost to the district. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I just thank you. I can't believe that number of um, IT tickets that you've done. <laughs> That's, wow. So thank you so much. Eric, thanks. Thanks to you and your team, and, and uh, it's always nice to hear. And we and we hear it from from each of our administrators that that it's teamwork. And, and you, you had teachers, administrators, um, volunteering, handing out the iPads, and I'm sure they're helping out in many other ways. But um, without the technology that you and your your team provided for us um, this year, um, I think the ship would have sunk. So I thank everyone, but but if you could thank your team for us, um, much. Much appreciated, and thanks for that report. <clears throat> thanks, Eric, very much. Um, okay, next up, uh, co-director of fine arts, we have Ms. Bailey and Ms. Garrow. Take it away, ladies. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, having us this evening. Um, we are going to uh, talk a little bit about our accomplishments that... Um, we achieved over the past year or so. Um, we've been fortunate enough to continue our collaboration with the Worcester Youth Orchestra um, for String of Palooza in uh, the winter time. Unfortunately, our uh, concert time was cut a little bit short um, this year, um, and we have not been able to further that partnership this year. Um, but hopefully next year we'll be able to do that. Um, we also have had a great deal of revision in our payment system and um, have transitioned completely to online uh, payments and registrations for our lessons in the district. We've also worked uh, very closely with Dr. Chamberlain on um, creating some new uh, stylistic changes with the presentation for the Festival of the Arts. So when we come back strong, hopefully in 2022, we'll be able to implement some of those changes for parents and students to have easier access to the festival itself. We also have had the return of our district traveling art exhibit over uh, last school year of 2019, uh, 2020. And uh, we had our students participate in our Worcester Art Museum Youth Month as well, back in February. Um, Jenny, would you like to speak a little bit to um, our accomplishments? Sure, so um, 
On the secondary level, we've been incredibly grateful to Eric Bouvier and the technology department. Um, they've really gone above and beyond to make sure that we were able to get the software that we've needed uh, to pivot to being able to offer um, quality music education in both a hybrid and fully remote model. Um, we are still offering ensembles. Um, both George Eisenhower and myself have been learning new technology, new software, um, finding new and creative ways to keep our kids engaged with singing and instrumental music. Uh, we're looking at some community outreach um, opportunities. We're also looking to continue our partnership with the Worcester Youth Orchestra in virtual offerings. Um, it's actually a very exciting time. It's really helped me think very critically about my, um, my skills as an educator, and I know I've grown a lot um, over the past six months just learning these tools and I can't imagine pivoting back to the old way of teaching. These, these tools are just tremendous in what they can offer our students. We're able to reach um, a wider variety of students, um, especially where the schedule at the high school doesn't always allow the students to be able to take instrumental or vocal music as often as they would like to. Uh, we have new ways to offer opportunities for them virtually and have them stay engaged and involved. So, um, so it's been a very exciting for us. We're looking at ways yeah. to, hmm? oh sorry, yeah. <laughs> We're looking at ways to, um, to still offer some type of festival of STEM and you know at least a music and arts type of fair in the spring. We're still working those things out with our department. Like I said, continuing our collaborations, we are looking to still offer some type of beginning band program through private lessons um, and signing up through, through Zoom lessons. And we can't wait until we can return in person when we're allowed to bring the marching band back um, safely, hopefully in the spring. And um, George has been teaching chorus outside and getting creative with, with masking. I don't know if anyone's seen the YouTube videos <laughs> with people wearing masks and playing their saxophones through bags and all of those other things. But um, we are, we're growing and changing every day with it and we're just excited that we're still um, encouraged to be creative and still offer these things for our students. So next year we look forward to continuing this growth and really just reconnecting with our community. So our budgetary items will will remain the same from FY21 um, into FY22 um, due to having a pause in our performance schedule we're able to take some time back regroup and focus on some of the other concept areas in music and in art this year um, so we will be um, our budget will be the same uh, for next year as it was this for um, FY21 um, and we'll be focusing on um, our band uniforms and our music repair and um, hopefully uh, everything will remain the same um, as far as our staffing goes and um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, push ahead in the future and keep our kids performing and out in the public eye um, as soon as this all passes, but it has been a tremendous opportunity to be able to explore some of the uh, technology tools and get to see students, particularly at the K through five level, performing on their own and doing a lot of solo work and videos and small performances that uh, they have shared with us. And so it's been a very um, wonderfully offered wonderful opportunity to get to see um, some of our kids shine individually this year and um, get to see their artwork and hear their music so it's it's been a wonderful time wonderful. One, of, one of the biggest reasons why we want to keep uh, the repair budget and also the instrument replacement budget um, at the same level is mostly because we don't know what the future will bring in terms of COVID and in terms of sharing instruments. We will have to look probably into increased sanitation, getting school owned instruments cleaned. Um, although we do clean them regularly, probably more so. And then instead of students being able to share instruments, for example, a sixth grader and an eighth grader using the same instrument, um, or a marching band student and a concert band student sharing the same instrument, we'll probably have to look into having dedicated instruments um, for you know the larger instruments, the tubas, barry saxes, um, sousaphones, et cetera, things like that. So um, again, we don't know what the future will hold. Um, we can just hope that um, 
that we're able to stay intact through this. And we have, um, we have great hope in uh, the fact that we'll be able to continue our strings program and um, all of our wonderful Appendix C programs next year as well. We do have plans still to try to offer a virtual musical. Um, so we are still trying to keep as much normalcy for our fine arts kids as, as humanly possible. So, and they're, they're troopers. They, they are so incredibly resilient. So um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too early, but um, look for some exciting things for coming from us soon. Okay. Great. Any if anybody comments? has any questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Comments, questions? I just have to say, no one has seen a kindergarten music class yet. I would encourage you to get into one of them because it is the funniest and best thing I think I've seen this year. Um, okay. Between Mrs. Garrow actually sang our dog into her song somehow, which was a, a pretty big deal to my little David. So, um, and again, even up to the high school, it's so, I mean, fine arts, arts is so important um, to these kids. So I'm really excited to see what else we get to see this year. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Just thank you for all your hard work. Mm -hmm. I would just say. I just, I just have to ask Casey. I'd love to, to see that um, video of kids playing the sax through a paper bag. Or, I have a sax player at home. Yeah. <laughs> really misses band. So <laughs> I think she'd get a kick out of it. I'm glad you guys are being creative. <laughs> the bag for the clarinet is also very interesting. <laughs> Myself, I, I have to say it's very strange. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll forward the video to Casey so he can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, so through the chair, I, that, that's actually something um, once we get through these, these budget, the budget presentations, um, we are going to assemble kind of, so, you know, a look inside, you know, our schools and, and what does virtual learning look like? Um, how are we adapting uh, to, you know, COVID uh, in, in areas such as fine arts? in an area such as physical education, um, as well as in, in our academic areas. Um, so uh, that will be coming um, uh, shortly. Good, so, that'll be awesome to see. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, quite, it's, quite the, it's quite the thing to see. <laughs> I, I will tell <laughs> I you, it's, um, it, you know, to what, Dr. Cham to, through what Dr. Chamberlain said earlier, I, the kids are so resilient. And, um, you know, to, to Ginny's point and Maria's point, um, you know, there, there are so many positive things coming out of this experience. That we're in right now. Um, Ginny's not the only uh, educator that I've heard say she can't imagine going back to teaching the quote unquote old way, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, when, when we're able to return in full time. So, um, terrific job, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have that information coming and uh, clips and other things to see. That's great. I, I was going to say um, something similar to that, and, and thank you for, for keeping the, the students engaged and uh, also. Um, we miss the shows. We miss the the marching band. We miss the plays. Um, we miss the musicals. We we miss we miss everything. Um, it's really it's really great though that you've been able to keep it going remotely because I think the I, I think the kids really need that. So appreciate your efforts. Um, I st I also want to see how you get the kid into the bag playing the instrument. That's gonna be <laughs> that's gonna be something. There's gonna be some big bags that you've got. So. <laughs> One for the two. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. No, th all seriousness, thank you for everything that you do, and thanks for keeping the kids engaged, excited, <laughs> and giving them something else to think about other than, you know, the pandemic. Yeah. Much Absolutely. appreciated. Thank you for your support. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice Have evening. Great. Thank you, ladies. Um, next up, uh, Director of Athletics, uh, Mr. Davis. Good evening, Mr. Davis. Good evening. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to just um, say hello to everybody, school committee, uh, Dr. Hanfield, um, Dr. Chamberlain, and all the administrators. Um, it is an amazing team uh, that you have in public schools, and I think we all are very fortunate to be in the positions that we are in. As we all know, um, this is a year like none other. I can just remember about, you know, all these Zoom meetings. Um, growing up, I always thought Zoom was just a TV show. <laughs> I, uh, I found out some, some different uh, things about Zoom 
with a lot of help from my neighbor, uh, Eric Bouvier, who I probably uh, <laughs> drive him crazy at times. But thank you, Eric. Um, this fall, um, again, like none other, but the one thing was we were very fortunate to have a fall season, unlike last spring when there was no athletics. Um, and the fall season was, you know, we didn't play regular 18 or 20 game schedule, but we did play 10 or 12 games. I, I believe the, uh, the coaches and, and the students, you know, they, they really did appreciate that. But this wouldn't have went without a hitch if, you know, we didn't have the help of the players, the coaches, the fans, the school committee members, the administration, and our Board of Health. It was, general, it was an amazing team effort because, uh, as we know, every day things, things can change in a blink. So I, I can't really thank enough uh, of all those people, the parents coming, um, you know, working, and only so many could come in. We only could have uh, one, one family member per family. So, uh, you know, the husband may come watch the first half, and he would have to leave and give his pass to his wife so she could come and watch the second half. But they were very understandable, and uh, it went really without a hitch. So I, uh, it was amazing. It really was. So I, I want to thank everybody for that. Uh, the fall season has been divided into two sections. We just did complete the fall season one. Fall two and I'll season, I will talk a little bit about that a little later. That season is going to uh, take place starting in February. And I will uh, fill you in on that, like I said, a little bit later. Um, a year ago, on November 23rd, uh, we lost a, a very important member of the Auburn faculty and Mr. Edward Bedard. Um, Ed was a longtime teacher here in the, in the uh, Department Head of the Technology um, Department. This past year, we have uh, established an Ed Bedard Memorial Scholarship um, where three students received $300 apiece in, in Mr. Bedard's uh, memory. And we're hoping this uh, particular Scholarship will go on for many, many years in memory of a great, great guy. Another group that uh, we, we've had here, the Auburn High School Leadership Group, which is made up of mostly captains of athletic teams, also band and chorus members. And really, anybody that shows some leadership qualities or even want to learn about being a leader. Um, we've, we've given out five $200 scholarships uh, where the alumni will come back sometime over the uh, semester breaks here at Christmas, and they would all receive their uh, their money then with them completing their first semester. So that, that's been nice. It's $1,900 between the Ed Bedard Scholarship as well as the uh, Leadership Scholarship. So that, that's a nice thing for our students. Um, also talking about the, the leadership team and the Auburn High Student Athletes, that organization, along with the band and chorus members, their main goal is to give back to the community by community service, maybe, you know, raking some leaves of families' homes, elderly homes, um, spending some time, not necessarily this year, at elderly uh, facilities and also maybe doing uh, people calling and wanting some uh, snow shoveled or moved. So that, that's really the, the uh, organization of the leadership giving back to the community. 50% of our students are also members of the National Honor Society uh, on the athletic teams. So a lot of our students, you know, they're held to stringent guidelines uh, so they can make sure they can stay on the, on the teams. And uh, the coaches usually will have weekly progress reports so we can monitor the, uh, you know, their, their progress. And if they are slipping, then we, we need to, uh, to remind them that, um, you know, no grades, no play. 
So that that's where that's where we're at with that. Um, talking about the fall two season, okay, um, where, where I said that would start in late February. The date is February 22nd. So the sports that would take place then that normally would have taken place this past fall will be football, uh, cheerleading, um, and indoor track. So we're hoping come February that um, in unified basketball, those, those four sports got moved from fall one season to fall two. Once we get to uh, April 22nd, we're hoping uh, we're somewhat closer back to being normal. And uh, that's when our spring season would start. This year, our spring season is starting on April 22nd, and it would end on July 3rd, um, which is really late normally, as we all know. But um, that would also include, you know, the traditional spring sports, the tennis, um, lacrosse, baseball, softball, girls golf, and unified track. Um, also, this year we could not do this, the Special Olympics. We, we work with this, the leadership team works with uh, Mrs. DeLuca and uh, Mrs. Reedy. We, we would help with the Special Olympics. So in the spring of 22, we're hoping that uh, we get that back up. It, it's a great day. And if you uh, are available, once that day gets finalized, it, 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 I think you would enjoy coming out in, uh, and seeing it. The other thing that we are working on now is uh, working towards finding an opponent for a long-term Thanksgiving Day football game. <clears throat> um, so that, that is something that, you know, we're trying to, uh, to iron out. But in the last few years, we've, you know, we've had some different opponents for various reasons none of our own, okay, it's just other people. Sometimes we were too good, and then other uh, times, just recently, uh, a school merged and uh, went on and played somebody else. So we are looking, uh, hopefully finalizing something where we would have a, uh, you know, a long-lasting relationship with, with a, uh, an opponent for Thanksgiving Day game. Also, um, we're all hoping academically as well as athletically, that we return to a traditional athletic season next year of full schedules and also having middle school athletics, which unfortunately we have not had this particular year. Our budget would remain the same as this past year. Um, we are in pretty good shape, or really very good shape, um, with our uniforms and everything else. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking forward to getting back to normal, just as well as all of you are in the classrooms. If there are any questions, I will be more than happy to answer them. Any questions or comments, Mr. Davis? No, just thank you for everything you've always done. Okay. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay, up next, we will hear, I think, jointly from Mrs. Mahan and Mrs. Stanick, principals at Bryn Mawr and Packachog, respectively. So, take it away, ladies. Good evening. Uh, I don't know if it's my computer or not, but it is very hard to hear the, the committee. Um, I just, just, if I don't answer your question, it's not because I'm ignoring you. But good evening. Welcome to my home. It is so nice to see you even on the computer and have the opportunity to share some of the accomplishments of Bryn Mawr and Packet Dog so far this school year. Through collaboration and perseverance, the Bryn Mawr and Packet Dog faculties have a lot to be proud of with both the hybrid and remote learning models. Mrs. Mahan and I have been able to schedule both ELA and math small groups for all students during their at-home learning days. Math interventions hosted by our math power professionals and instructional assistants have been added to provide additional remote math support to students. Teachers conducted Dibbles assessments 
which is one of our literacy benchmark assessments for all students. And we will begin remote interventions next week for our students most in need of literacy support. Given the current learning environment, we made an adjust adjustment to specialist offering. Media literacy was adapted to a love for literacy special. Literacy is crucial for our students and we felt additional practice with reading comprehension skills and strategies made great sense. As you know, we have provided all students and support staff with iPads, as well as providing laptops, web cameras, and updated iPads for all teaching staff. Our digital learning platform, Seesaw, has been an excellent addition to our programming. Students access the platform through ClassLink, where they have access to their daily schedule along with assignments. Students have the opportunity to submit assignments in a variety of ways, from typing, recording, uploading documents, to simply drawing. Teachers have access to an abundant library of activities that align with the standards for all content areas. We have found creative ways to keep our community connections alive, like tonight, we make virtual connections with our partners in education through Zoom. We held our annual Literacy Month during the month of November, and students had the opportunity to hear from local author Kate Hanscom during their Love for Literacy special. We continue to emphasize the social emotional well being of our students and staff daily. PBIS lessons are conducted virtually along with online reward systems in recognition of positive behavior. Our school counselors have virtual classrooms for students to explore, continue to conduct weekly lessons with a second step program, and meet virtually with small groups of students, as well as individually with students and parents. Our buildings are equipped with proper supplies and all staff has done an amazing job learning the safety protocols and procedures to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19. The nursing staff works tirelessly to keep our students and staff safe and we can't thank them enough. Additionally, the dedication of the custodial staff during this time has not gone unnoticed. The professional development days at the beginning of the year were utilized to transition staff, students and families, hybrid and remote learning. This additional time was also utilized to host our town hall meetings with principals, nurses, and classroom teachers. Classroom teachers met individually with students and their families to build relationships and answer individual questions prior to the start of the year. Teachers met virtually for parent-teacher conferences and connect with families through Seesaw, email, and Zoom on a regular basis. The additional planning time on Wednesday afternoons has been beneficial in order to plan ahead, brainstorm solutions, and connect with each other. I want to thank you for your support, and I'll now turn it over to Mrs. Mahan. Muted. Muted. And you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. You think by now I would be good with the Zoom meetings. <laughs> good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. And I'd like to share with you some of the expected accomplishments for FY22 for both Bryn Mawr and Pakatog. Next year, when we regain normalcy, we will revert to our established schedule. Our highly effective co-teaching practices will resume at all grade levels to meet student needs. With this adjustment to our schedule, our daily intervention block will be brought back allowing us to have targeted small group instruction for all students K-2. We will establish Project Lead the Way for all students. Having Mrs. LeBreton return to her media technology role will allow for Mrs. Benuccio and Mrs. Benoit to resume their roles as our reading specialists at both Bryn Mawr and Pakatog schools. With the ability to move safely throughout the building, we will be able to con conduct our positive praise walks for staff and students. As previously stated, Mrs. LeBreton will resume her media technology role and we look forward to offering technology again as a special for all students K through 2. We are excited to use the Seesaw app and we intend to utilize Seesaw next year to create portfolios for all of our students. 
We will continue to refine the use of technology to support students and their achievement. With the start of FY22, we will reestablish in-person community service learning projects, field trips, programs, along with our after-school enrichment activities. We are excited to open our doors and welcome back volunteers into our building. We look forward to supporting our families by reestablishing the before school programs and expanding the after school programs. We will have the ability to restore our pre-COVID social school gatherings, such as lunch, recess, math night, literacy night, and other after school activities held for our families. Next year, we look forward to reinstating our second grade tours to Swanson Road and welcome in our new, our incoming kindergartners to our building, our classrooms. We are eager to support students, families, and staff with all vertical transitions. We will evaluate all opportunities that ensure strong transitions both in and out of our buildings as well as between buildings. And we will take advantage of the many silver linings that came from the new procedures and build on those to move forward. In closing, I just want to thank you all for your continued support and ask if you have any questions for Ms. Stanek or myself. Any questions or comments? Just thank you for everything you've done. No, 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 no. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your support. Thanks, ladies. Thank you both very much. Appreciate it. Uh, next up will be Dr. Lopez from the Swanson Road Intermediate School. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Before I begin, I just wanted to take a moment to sincerely thank the Auburn Community Central Office, the school committee, and especially the teachers, all of the teachers out there for the incredible work that has been by no means an easy task for anyone over the course of this past year. Despite the many challenges that were faced both in the lives of all of us personally as well as professionally, we have undoubtedly created stronger bonds and insights into each other as educators, as parents and guardians, and of course, learners on every level. As I started to think about the accomplishments that we've had over the past year, it gave me pause for a lot of reflection. But as I sat down and started to think about these, I had an incredible sense of pride uh, for the great work that I've been part of and have observed in so many people, in my staff and especially in the awesome students at Swanson Road. In teaching and learning, not only did we expand the, the use of online tools and resources, we developed still specific and targeted ways in which to use these tools so that every student would be able to have greater access to the learning opportunities afforded to them. We also were able and had the existing data to create comprehensive and structured small group learning teams for all students. And as we moved through the year, we saw the gains being realized and I was actually very excited and looking forward to end of year benchmarks as well as the state assessment in the spring. However, as you know, fate didn't have that in the plans for us. And despite those challenges that we faced last spring, we were able to finish out the year strong. Though fully remote at the end, we did have many successes. And during the summer, we continued to plan and build on the foundation that had already been laid for and by our students and staff. In doing that, we were able to begin the hybrid and fully remote schedules and create those and the additional services that needed to be in place. With the support of and in conjunction with all of the teachers, the specialists, administration, we devised a plan that centered on students that would maximize the time that was face-to-face, -face, as well as provide as many authentic and meaningful remote learning opportunities when we couldn't be face-to-face. As we know, we, love, we want the students in school, and that has been extremely, extremely well received. Additionally, throughout the course of the year, we constantly kept in mind the developmental needs of the students and ways that we could bring learning to life. This was seen in some of the many school-wide events that we were able to extend, whether it was programming or enrichment opportunities. And though during the course of the year, we had to move from those face-to-face -face opportunities and things that we would typically expose and have for our students in the tr traditional way, we were able to provide these learning experiences virtually 
and try to maintain that engagement in a very uneasy time. Proudly, throughout the course of all of that, we were recognized as a Project Lead the Way school with 100% student participation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it was to all the work that was done by, uh, in collaboration with central office, with teachers, with our technology specialists to make that happen. We were also recognized as a unified school and had a car parade to recognize some of our most special students who worked so hard all year long in physical education classes with their partnered peers. I couldn't have been more proud of them. In the area of technology, we always had varying degrees of technology integration and lessons that were embedded into the programming. This year, however, we were able to successfully train all students and support staff how to utilize the Google Classroom format or platform systematically and school-wide. Really become familiar with Zoom meetings and how to navigate that tool use Nearpod to enhance academics and class, class tag to streamline parent communications. These platforms were adopted by the Swanson community and continue to be refined every day. On that same vein, we continued the use of standardized programmatic tools to think of ways we could embed the affirmation, the affirmation to enhance our ability to develop students' understanding and using, like everyone knows, the 21st century tools. Throughout the course of this time, the community partnerships grew like never before in ways that we never thought that we'd see, parents and teachers working together, students and teachers working together, and it just reinforced the tight school district that we are, depending on each other and the departments within the town to support each other, not only in our mission, but in the mission of Auburn and the community at large. It didn't just merely shift where our community interactions became more important, but they became virtual. Regardless of whatever was needed, everyone stepped up. The learning projects, the videos, the slideshows, the songs, the fun school-wide community team builders that were done and participated in and by everyone in our community spoke volumes and the responses that were received by so many were just so appreciated. These school-wide events needed a lot of strategic planning because we were forced to look at things through a different lens we hadn't used before in an effort to provide some consistency to the traditions that Auburn, I think, holds dear, those road races, the parades, the school events that we've always had. On our end, the little things that we were able to maintain and keep in, as a tradition was the farewells that we were able to provide. Though they were drive-by farewells, we did them for every grade level, and we did have some special events to try to make our departing fifth graders feel special in some way. It, of course, couldn't be done without the support of everyone that was involved, the parents, the community members, the students, and the dedicated staff. In health and wellness, as you know, we've always made this a top priority. We continue to look at building-based protocols and the safety nets to ensure the safety of our students with our safety team's guidance. Again, this year our, our focus shifted to address and establish COVID-based protocols and those safety systems throughout our school community so that we could return to school in an environment that was not only safe, but warm and welcoming. Part of this work was looking at our PBIS matrix to reflect hybrid and remote learning needs of teachers and students and trying to create that cohesive school-wide expectation to support all of our diverse learners. It made both learning face-to-face -face as well as online seamless. Those adaptions were just made, shared with our community and just reinforced in that positive light every day in all, um, every aspect. Our clinical team, continues and continue to use the data, the observations and teacher recommendations to create their comprehensive targeted tier two and tier three interventions during spring COVID and as well as coming into the fall school season. The tracking systems that, we're, that we use to support some of our most at-risk students really made it um, bond together and be able to support families at home during these times as well. Transitions, as many have heard over the course of the year, it's always an area we continue to refine. As the people who work most closely with students want to ensure that their continued success 
with the next teacher does continue, whether it's at the next school or with the next teacher. These transitions and the meetings that occurred not only provided the information needed to support students on day one, but also allowed collaborative planning that led to successful supports that began immediately when they arrived on our doorsteps and in our classrooms in the fall. Some of the ways we did this was the video creations that we had of school tours, tours of classrooms that were sent to students and families, meet the teachers through videos and PowerPoints, and later see how the changes due to COVID safety protocols changed the look of our school slightly, but still in the most warm and welcoming way. Finally, providing parents and families access not only to their teachers, their administrators, but also the nurses, the counselors, made all of these transitions a lot easier. And as a result, I was so impressed at the transition this year um, in lieu of all the other challenges that we, were, that we faced, the countless hours, all of that planning really paid off. Students came in and got right to it and it was great to have them back and it was school like every other time. The outcomes and accomplishments going forward, one can only hope that we can work towards and imagine the best and it's with that uh, rose-colored lens or glass that I'm hoping that the following are the accomplishments at Swanson. In terms of teaching and learning, uh, it will be continued to use the blended practices and use the lessons learned through the technology experiences and expertise that have been acquired to enhance the learning that will be occurring. Embedding and reestablishing the peer projects and resources that were discovered that really maximize the different learning styles that we continue to discover. We're looking forward to a variety of scheduling options with students receiving daily targeted win sessions or what I need in ELA and math as we continue to make um, any of those gaps smaller and smaller in students' learning needs. Similarly, looking at the curriculum, we also want to ensure that the materials that we are using and the best practices are in place um, to the best of our ability. So always reviewing that and revisit that to make sure that we're serving our community of learners the best we can. The next task in terms of teaching and learning will be to go back and review again the curriculum to address and enhance the new social studies standards and just make sure that we're aligned and continue continuing that work with our teachers and making sure that we're doing the best um, to give students what they need with those standards. In terms of technology, I don't know if anybody wants any more technology, <laughs> um, but we'll hopefully be looking to reinstate more STEM, uh, reestablish project lead the way. A lot of that is hands-on, and we know that those learning projects and that collaboration between students and student engagement and creative minds is so critically important. So really looking to that goes back in terms of technology more on the STEM line and those cross-curricular opportunities and also using the Zoom, Google Classroom, Class Tag, Nearpod, maintaining that because that does give us um, a nice and open communication with families that I think have been uh, strengthened tremendously because we've had to do it this way, um, but also successfully. One area, important area that we'd like to refine is looking at how to look, uh, how we can use synchronous and asynchronous lessons going forward and what we've learned um, from this time. And again, focus on those cross-curricular and cross-classroom, cross-grade level opportunities to use STEM, art and science, health and wellness, and bring these together in a way that supports all students and also develops that peer-to-peer -peer school community and um, vertical teaming that we, that we need to continue to work on. My team and I also envision rebuilding and reestablishing our community partnerships. It's been hard not having parents come in building or come in and visit and have meetings with us face-to-face, -face, uh, but also looking to really enhance and strengthen our culturally proficient uh, or proficiency in trying to get all of our community members and our diverse community involved in ways that maybe they hadn't been before. Honestly, the hope would be greater involvement in school and validation and the beauty, the richness that comes from all of our students and their uh, diverse families. We'd also like to expand and bring back the PBIS parent involvement in all of the activities that we've had. 
the community service learning projects, the school-wide culture building events. We're trying to look at ways that we can still do these things, but we have to constantly be thinking of not only creative, but safe ways to do so. In health and wellness and safety, we continue to enhance the impact of our school guidance counselors and mental health um, issues that we may be facing for our students, uh, the families that we're serving through whether it's lessons, focus lessons, small group interventions, we continue to do that and really seek to refine using the data that we have for family outreach as well for wraparound. As always, we'll continue to revisit those needs and um, look at the data that we have, the observations that we're able to have and provide the professional development so that we are all on the same um, level in terms of trauma-informed practices and keeping that uh, part of our practice. Finally, looking at transitions moving forward, how they will look going forward. I think based on what we've learned, we now have the capacity and know how to provide multiple opportunities that staff can meet um, virtually as well as in person. And, and scheduling that is a bit simpler on some levels, but having the ability to do a bit in um, a hybrid model might uh, be something we want to incorporate going forward to not only discuss student needs, but their strengths so that like we had this year, we were able to have that seamless transition from teacher to teacher, student to student. And we're hoping going forward that those transitions from Swanson to AMS continue, as well as Pakachog Bryn Mawr coming up to Swanson Road, working together to make sure we, we support the students so that any fears or, or any uh, strengths or exceptional learning that they need are addressed. So I think with all of that, I could envision a lot more, but that's really it in as much of a nutshell as I can provide. Excellent. Any comments or questions for Dr. Lopez? Thank you for all your work and your staff. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you to the teachers as well. Thank you, thank you for that report, Dr. Lopez. Um, yeah, we're certainly doing something right here. When I say we, I mean all of you, um, because our children can't wait to get to school. So, so that that excitement is there. Um, it's something that that all of you are providing, and um, we appreciate that very much. Thank, thank you for, thank you. Thank you, Susan, um, very much. I appreciate that <coughs> report, uh, Mr. Desto. Good evening. Unmute yourself. <laughs> Rookie boy. mistake. Oh, boy. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I, I just want to start by saying I'm, I'm feeling like a very blessed person in my career because I really loved my time teaching in Worcester. My two decades in Dudley Charlton were, were outstanding. And when I knew that I had to leave, um, you know, I. I just was so fortunate to, I didn't know it at the time, but to, to fall into a place, I knew Auburn was a successful district, but uh, what you can't know until you become a part of it is how good the people are. And I've just been uh, so fortunate to work with the people I see uh, on this screen. Uh, they've been great colleagues, great support uh, for me, always good for a laugh uh, when it's needed and so forth. And, um, you know, Casey and Beth uh, have just been tremendous about reaching out to all of us on a daily basis and offering whatever help they could provide. And, um, I learned when I was superintendent how tough it is to be a member of the school committee. The pay is terrible also, um, <laughs> what pay? but you know, I, I, there's pressure on you too, and, I, and I'm grateful for the support that you've given all of us from the tippity top of the district. I have to start with a very brief but, uh, but a powerful story that illustrates why I'm so grateful to be back with the kids in the middle school. This only happens in a middle school. E each morning I tell... Uh, on the morning announcements, I tell a story of something that happened on this day in history, and then I spin it into uh, a lesson for the day. Now, the, the story is usually something educational. Well, then I go from class to class. This year, I started going from class to class to be more, uh, connect with the kids as much as I could, and tell them something else that happened this day in history that may be a little less educational. An example being, um, the other day I went around and I told the students that it was a very tragic day in history because it was on this day in 1980 when I was 10 years old that Led Zeppelin broke up. And I know Mr. Scobie was probably stung by that as well. Uh, but the kids immediately said, Led what? Led who? 
What is that? What are they saying? And then one girl said, very brave soul in the back said, oh, I know who Led Zeppelin is. My grandmother listens to them. They're gross. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, gee, I, I've never heard them described as gross. You know, you know, we all have different tastes in music and so forth. I said, well, who do you like? And she said, I don't know, Justin Bieber. And we carried on for about five minutes a good uh, enthusiastic discussion about who's better between Justin Bieber and Led Zeppelin. And so that illustrates how, how great it is to be in a middle school. Um, a couple of people earlier tonight have used the, the word heroic to describe what's happening in our schools. And I don't think that's an overstatement of what's happening. Um, I, I said uh, to somebody recently, really adverse times reveal people's character. And this has been the toughest time I can remember in education. And I have gained so much respect for the people who I work with at Auburn Middle School and in the Auburn Public Schools throughout this time. It's just been amazing. Everyone on our staff, whether it's Matt, the secretaries, our guidance staff, our custodians, our teaching staff, and I want to make a, sure that I give a, a quick shout out to our cafeteria staff as well because we are, at our school, we're the hub for the Meals to Go program and watching the cafeteria staff, not just my people, but also throughout the district, has just blown me away how they've just found a way. The, the word that keeps coming to mind is evolution. The evolution of our staff to, cra to cater their craft, change their craft to get to what the students need in this situation has been nothing short of sensational. And I'm so proud of my staff, and I know everybody here is proud of their staff as well. So a, a few things that I, I do want to bring up uh, more specifically to what's happening in our school is that we made a decision early on when we went from not really having any idea what we were going to do uh, to where we are now, that we were going to still offer kids a well-rounded schedule, which is what middle schools are supposed to do. And so um, just as a general thing, I want to say I'm really proud that we're able to offer our students still, despite these circumstances, five core subjects per day, academic support blocks. Uh, each kid has a STEM, or te a STEM technology class physical education and or health, a foreign language each kid will have had by the end of the school year. Uh, we have significant academic support classes for select students who really need it, and also accelerated math and English uh, classes for students who are uh, learning at a more rapid pace. And of course, so social emotional support time uh, built in as needed. We're really proud that despite the, um, how difficult it is with staffing and, and so forth, and that we're still able to offer that kind of program somehow uh, to our students. The, as I mentioned earlier, the improvements that our staff, our teaching staff has made in being able to use online tools to teach using multiple screens and multiple cohorts um, is, has been really amazing and I'm so proud of them. They've evolved uh, so remarkably. Um, just a few other things to, that I want to bring bring up and highlight, one being community partnerships that we have, uh, we're happy to have been able to maintain our strong partnership with Auburn Youth and Family Services. Almost 100% of the kids they serve are our kids, and um, we were able to uh, help them quite a lot with our Thanksgiving food drive. We currently have uh, a holiday fuzzy sock and pajama drive. Uh, as I say, I don't think the, the pajamas have to be fuzzy, but the socks do. Um, <laughs> and we have a, a hat day upcoming uh, where we'll collect money in order to help uh, AYFS as well. So we want to continue to illustrate that even in the most difficult times, we still need to serve our community. Um, probably the, the biggest challenge, in my book anyway, has been the amount of kids who struggle in this model and, and just being able to know, I mean, because we've always been reliant and dependent upon the home as educators to some degree, but now we are tremendously. And so in some situations, the students are really struggling, particularly when they're not at school. Um, so that's where uh, our student support team has really come through and done an amazing job making frequent contact with teachers so they know uh, who's struggling, then with families, with students, uh, we will be assigning, we'll be starting our attendance mentor program uh, Monday with the beginning of trimester two, which means that any time particular students who have attendance challenges are absent, somebody is assigned to call the house the minute we know that they're not in school. And that personal connection uh, we found last year to be helpful. 
Uh, we've used a lot of non-traditional strategies to support students, such as, as you saw recently, our therapy dog, Ella. And um, our Bright program is up and running. And as Dr. Chamberlain said, it's not quite the same as it was uh, last year. But at the same time, it's, we're able to help some students through the program. And uh, we've also got a schedule that offers a slower pace of the day with longer breaks in between classes. Uh, we needed that for mask breaks, but it's turning out to be helpful as well to just put a, make a pace through the day that isn't quite so uh, stressful and intense. Um, so I just, I'll end with how we're doing this year uh, by just saying I've never seen so many students say thank you uh, for nothing really. I, I guess just thank you, Mr. Desto, on their way out. And it's, I, uh, so many of them are just so glad to be back in school um, and so really proud of, of how our students have responded to this as well. Uh, they're always the, the stars of the show, but um, this year in particular, the, the resilience that they've shown has been quite remarkable. As we look toward um, not just next year, but maybe even the, the end of this year and, and how things may change, uh, none of us know how that'll be, but um, right after January, we'll begin meeting us with our school improvement teams to build schedules, building logistics, student support services, and school climate um, the, the old uh, expression, return to normalcy, at some point we're going to return to normalcy and it's gonna be a lot harder than it sounds. I mean, I think we all know that while we're excited for that day to come, we also know that it's going to be difficult because when, you know, if all of a sudden my students walk in and see a huge crowd in the lobby, just that alone is, is gonna be shocking to them. And <laughs> how many people are still gonna to wanna to wear masks every day and, and uh, still have that, that reaction? So. Uh, we're, we're starting to think about re what it's going to be like to return to normalcy, but looking toward next year, we want to continue to be one of the only middle schools anywhere uh, where every single kid has an arts class, a PE or health class, a foreign language class, a STEM class in, in addition to their core subjects. There's, I've, I've talked to as many principals as I know, and I don't know another middle school that has it. Now, there may be one. I, don't, I haven't talked to everybody, but we're really, really proud of that. Um, we're also thinking about uh, looking toward next year when we have, when we're fully staffed again, to be able to have um, financial literacy and digital citizenship more embedded into the, the daily uh, curriculum. Um, relative to technology, we think that one of the thing, one of the ways that we can use, have community partnerships and an improvement in technology is we're we're talking about a welcome to our world program, and what this would be is the students making instructional videos for families about the latest trends in social media and technology and those kind of things. And the student that I talked to about it said, it's not welcome to our world, it's welcome to our world program. Okay, so you have to say it like that. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And um, also really looking forward, and obviously we can't do this until we know it's safe but uh, for everybody, but to reestablishing our partnership with Auburn Life Care Center, which we had a very strong partnership with. They're, right, they're our neighbors. Um, and I'll, I'll close with this and then uh, take any questions you may have. We, even before March 12th, um, we were talking about a mental health crisis. And so this has done nothing to help that. Um, and we do realize that as next year or the return to normalcy um, happens, we need to really be prepared uh, for helping students manage their anxiety, uh, their depression that, that may have uh, set in and that may have just become uh, more of a challenge throughout these, these times. So um, we talk frequently and one of our school improvement teams is geared specifically toward that. How do we make our school day not be an additional stressor for students, but rather to be something that helps them manage anxiety, that helps them to be de-stressed uh, throughout the course of their day. It's not going to be an easy task. We've got kids from 11 to 14 years old who by nature are often stressed anyway, even in the best of circumstances. Um, but it's something that we're paying significant attention to before we um, return to the way things used to be. So that's pretty much it. I, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing and looking forward to doing next year. Um, and I'll certainly try to answer any questions you may have. Great. Any comments or questions, Mr. Desto? Thank you for all you're doing mm -hmm. and your staff. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Desto, next time 
Oh, good. Uh, no, I, I was just going to say, I think it all sounds good. And at least in our home, you know, the high reliability stuff, that's really important. Yeah. Um, so I think that we're all going to be doing that. Yeah. 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 For our own household, I think the slowing down of the pace has, it's kind of opened my eyes to how, as you said, how stressed these kids just get when they walk into the building because they've got to be here and there and everywhere. So um, I, I think it would be great if we can ease, you know, especially for this age group, like work on easing them back in and maybe the pace shouldn't be as rigorous as it once was. Maybe that was contributing to um you know, some of the underlying mental health issues we were seeing before. If there's anything we can take away from this crazy experience that we're living through right now, I think it would be, you know, worth examination. But thank you guys so much. I, I have a happy middle schooler in my house, and we're just, she's happy to go to school every day. And I think that that's really, you know, a testament to what you guys are doing right there. So thank you so much. Thank you. I agree. I agree with that, um, Todd, definitely. Um, the kids are very excited to get to school, and, and that's what I was going to say. And next, I was going to say next time someone asks me how things are going, I'm going to steal um, Greg's words, and I'm going to say things are evolving because that's what's happening. And I agree with him on that point, and I also agree that um, we just have the, gr the greatest team here. And, and a lot of times you hear, you hear people say that. You hear them say, well, we have the greatest team, or, or, or you're the greatest, or, or he's the greatest, or she's the greatest. But when you look around and, and you, hear, um, you hear from the, the students, from the children, what's going on in the schools, um, it's obvious that, that it's teamwork, and that, that's what got us here. So um, like, like Dot said, um, the, the mornings that my son gets up to do um, his hybrid learning, very, it's very slow. It's a slow walk down the stairs, it's a slow shower, it's a slow everything. But when it's time to go to school, when it's time to go to the middle school, um, he's up, he's ready to go, he eats a little bit quicker, um, he just can't wait to get there. So again, like, like, like the others, you're doing something right at the middle school and I would agree that it's a team. Um, nice report. Um, lastly, I would just say, next time you're looking for support, don't go to the Justin Bieber fans. Just give me a call if you're feeling, <laughs> if you're feeling down about Led Zeppelin. We can discuss it. <laughs> and you were right. It did, it did sting, Mr. Desto. It did. <laughs> Thank you for that report. Yeah, Thank Mr. You. Desto, I just need to know, was it Clara talking about her grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. A little more crazy the story. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Greg, very much for that. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And uh, we will round out the evening with uh, Mr. DeLongchamp from Auburn High School. Good evening. Good evening. I hope you're all doing well. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, it's, it's really nice to be with you tonight. Um, and as a brand new principal, I, I, could, I think I could spend my whole time thanking the various people who have um, so graciously given me their time. Um, it just, you know, to, to reacquaint myself with the Auburn community this way has been quite the experience. But, um, you know, I, I have to shout out some special thanks to Dr. Hanfield, um, Dr. Chamberlain, um, the principals, certainly Eileen, because um, they, they have definitely taken a challenging time and, and helped make it a, um, a smooth transition. So I'm very, very thankful. Um, before I begin and talk about accomplishments, I, I would, um, I, I think I would be awful if I didn't make special acknowledgement of my faculty and staff. Um, these people have been willing to take on any challenge, and as, as you've all heard, we've had many. Um, tru truly just an amazing group of people, um, some of the most kind, compassionate people that I'm lucky to know. Um, they often, um, even, even when I tell them not to, put Auburn High School before their own family at times. And, I, I couldn't ask for a better crew, and I'm um, very, very, very thankful. When I think of when I think of the first trimester, in my time, the, the two particular snapshots that come to mind, and I think um, our, our careers are made of snapshots. And um, the first one is I was outside um, in the fall, and it was prior to the start of um, the sports season. But these three these three young ladies, who I obviously I don't know very well, they approached me, and like Mr. DeLongchamp, I know you don't know us, but thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to play field hockey. 
you might have thought I'd given them a bag of gold and um, they were just so gracious. And it just made me realize how much these kids are hurting. Um, the other experience, um, I happened to be walking out. There was no particular game. I was just taking a walk outside after a long day. And there was this group of boys, group of freshman boys, and they were just all kind of like sunning themselves on the field, um, just, just kind of hanging out. And you know, it almost looked normal besides the masks. And you know, we just began talking, and um, it, it was nice. And I, I asked the hey, is there anything I can do for you? And hey, is there, you know, I, oftentimes they don't get the chance to lend their voice. And they said to me, uh, Mr. DeLongchamp, I just want to go back to school four days. Can you make that happen? And um, obviously both, both snapshots are particularly powerful in their own way. Um, I feel like, I, I think we all probably feel like at times that we, we have this job where we have to make really challenging decisions on a regular basis that don't always make people happy. And, um, you know, in my career, these last 26 years, I've always tried to figure out solutions on how to like make some of these things happen. And it, at times it's just so frustrating because we can't give them what they need and what they want. Um, but uh, again, two things that really, really will stick with me probably for forever. Um, so I, I do want to share that. In regards to accomplishments, um, you know, I have to mention I think when we finally came up with the schedule, I think the schedule really helped us at the high school. It's a hybrid of a hybrid schedule. And I think it, it was the safest way um, to make things work and at the same time continue with our programming um, very much the same as it was um, in the past. I wanted to give the kids back something that was similar because I, I didn't know what the future would hold for us. And I thought um, something similar would make them feel safe and the ability to be able to do that um, and be in it has been um, as, as challenging as it has been to create our own remote school on top of being a hybrid school. Um, I, I feel like it's, it's totally worth it. Um, a lot of what we've been able to accomplish has occurred um, because of reflection. You know, I, just because we do something a, a certain way doesn't mean we have to stay in that um, particular format. And I, I think between my conversations with the leadership team, um, my department chairs, you know, we've been able to, as time has gone on, we've, we've, we have a playbook now. We, we walked in with not a playbook and, you know, nobody knew what this experience was going to be like. And now we've been in this, we've powered through it. We know what works, we know what doesn't work. So the ability to reflect and revise has really certainly been um, a strength of the team. Um, what we started off, we, we certainly don't look the same way in regards to our instructional practices, our use of technology. Um, and our support services. Regards to um, our goals, our goal all along was to create um, a strong learning model in which um, all of our kids could grow academically as well as have the variety of supports in place from an academic, social, emotional, and behavioral standpoint. And that was really important that whatever we put in place um, met those needs. Regards to specific academic accomplishments, we really spent a lot of time over the summer and then we've modified and adjusted, creating a tiered support system to help the students who are struggling the most while still having a system that all students can access. Um, the realization that, um, I guess, and I, I guess the version of me, the 15 or 16 year old version of me would have had a hard time with the amount of independent um, learning that's, that goes along in a hybrid or a remote model like this. Um, and math has been a challenge We've, um, we've been able to, to learn from the last several weeks, and we've been able to create a um, fully synchronous math program where students will, um, uh, for trimester two, they'll, they'll be immersed um, both from home and at school with their math teachers. Um, the teachers were very, very creative, um, far more creative than I think I could have been with the technology that they have. Um, and um, I applaud them. They, we didn't need to buy anything. We didn't need to, you know, we didn't need to go get some kind of fancy camera. They took the tools they were given and they were able to modify and adapt. So um, I'm really excited and looking forward to seeing what that looks like. Um, but from the piloted classrooms that we've tried, it, it seems like it's going to be a success. Um, incorporation of, um, you know, again, we I listened to Mr. Desto talk about challenges with mental health. Um, and the incorporation of social emotional learning experiences in our classrooms. I think when we're all done with this, this is one particular area that um, we're going to we're going to know that we need to have in place 
um, from the onset, whether we're um, in any kind of model that we're in, and the importance of um, you know building the relationship with the student, being able to provide them supports, then not only teaching them in such subject matter, but how to access, giving them the roadmaps and the pathways so they can be successful and they can be independent. Because at the end of the day, you know our goal is when they leave the high school that they're fully independent. Um, and they're able to access their strengths and um, and be able to seek out help and communicate appropriately. So, um, I, my hope is that we 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 take these social emotional activities and these experiences, and then they become just part of our curriculum as we go forward. Um, in addition, um, you know, we've over the course of um, the first trimester to the second trimester, we've got a transition. We have. Have several students that are going to be moving back into the school so we have orientation activities that we've created so students understand not only our health and safety protocols in the building but um, how to access um, support staff how to access administration um, and be able to get around the building so we are we're super excited to have uh, more students back and i think um, i'm looking forward to a time when we have all of them back in fact from a technology standpoint wow uh, i can tell you i've learned so much in the last in the last four or five months um, you know, a funny story is um, somebody called me probably in April, well, not even, it wasn't April, it was February, and said, hey, you know, you know things aren't looking great, and, you know, uh, nobody ever knew how bad this was going to be, and they said, you should start investigating Zoom. And almost like Brian, I'm like, oh, what is Zoom? I've never heard of Zoom before. And now, that is, that is our whole life. Um, and I, you know, I, I think about that moment often. But I do think something else we're going to take from this whole experience is the incorporation um, of technology into our classrooms going forward. Um, I teachers have learned so much. Um, I, I have a fantastic crew that put together trainings for other other schools in the district. Um, and um, you know, you could walk around the building and you could see them using any number of tools um, to, um, to not only bring the students who are home into the classroom, but also to Create situations that we can't do in a physical uh, in a physical way anymore. So it's nice to see the kids working in groups, and if it has to be remotely or on a on a virtual platform, then so be it. Um, from a community partnership, um, we we're grateful for Auburn Youth and Family Services. Um, we've you know we've had our food and clothing drives with them, and and we know that they're. Um, their services that they provide can really help during this time period in regards to just the strains on our support staff and um, that just dealing with dealing with the amount of mental health um, that we're faced with. Uh, in regards to um, other community partnerships, I, I believe in full transparency. I want the community to know exactly what's going on in the school, what we offer, new changes, updates. Um, I tried to put out a newsletter each week. Um, particular focus um, of recent is uh, monthly articles in regards to teen um, choose the teens face and challenges um, just to provide some support for parents um, because uh, you know having teenagers myself I know how hard it is and then you know you tackle and that that's just in a normal year not on top of a pandemic so yeah, I, we're going to continue to do those things and make sure that we provide resources for the community um, just because we know that we see the kids for um, you know five hours of the day and they have them for the um, remainder uh, we you know we continue to meet with families both um, um, for programming purposes as well as to come up with um, specific programming for students who may be struggling that happens regularly um, in regards to health and wellness as the other principals had mentioned um, our COVID our COVID based health protocols um, are fully utilized at all times in the building. Um, our nursing our nursing staff is absolutely first class. Um, we could do a whole we could do a whole um, evening just on our nursing staff. Um, they've done programming for our staff. They continue to give us updates. Um, just a, an amazing group of people who are really um, dealing with an awful lot right now. Um, we created a cultural committee. Um, a lot of you know high school. If we all go back and think about high school, we think about proms and we think about um, all the different events that go on in Auburn. There's some strong traditions, whether it's lip syncs and um, talent shows, and you know these kids. Mr. Uh, Mr. Auburn came across my desk today and trying to create ways in which to um, carry these events out. 
Um, I'm pleased to announce that we will have a virtual lip sync contest. I hope none of you are able to see it because I've been asked to perform in two acts and I have, I don't know why you're laughing at me. Um, I, I, ha I have little to no talent or grace, but I'm going to try. Um, they, if you can believe this, I have a video that they told me that I have to practice these dance moves um, by myself to a song I don't understand. Um, so uh, in, in addition, um, I, I, you know, besides the fabulous staff, we just have amazing, caring kids. Um, kids came to me and said, we miss the students who are fully remote and we want to write postcards to them. So our graphics department created, um, had a postcard unit or had an art unit where they created um, postcards. The students voted on 10 or 12 different postcards. And then um, members of our 365 team um, then wrote postcards and sent them out to each of the kids who are fully remote, telling them that they miss them and um, just sending them a positive message around Thanksgiving. In addition, the students thought that they wanted to give back to the high school staff. So the student council wrote um, postcards and put them in the teachers' mailboxes or on their desks, just with a simple thank you note um, of how much they appreciate what the staff is going through and what they're doing for them. Um, you know, we, we've had our food, food and clothing drives. I, again, you know, we have some challenges ahead because, you know, there's some things that um, these kids really have missed out on and trying to create creative ways to make some of these things happen. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you all posted as time goes on, but it, it's they're just challenging. Um, but I do know that these are the kind of things, these are the kind of positive distractions that get these kids through the day. Um, transitions, you know, I, I think about that often um, when the time's right and when we receive the right guidance. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to those meetings when I'm sitting with the principals trying to figure out ways in which to get more of our students back with us for more time. Um, and um, as we, as I, as I look into, uh, it's awful hard. I'll be completely honest with you, with everything that we're in the world that we're living in. It's awful hard to think about the future. Um, but I would say that a lot of the accomplishments um, that I think about for next year, uh, I think one of the first and foremost things that probably on all of our minds, you know, what has this done to our church? You know, how much has it impacted them? You know, where is the regression? then how can we support them? Where do, you know, and, and that's gonna be a, a major focus of, of mine and our team. We've begun having some of those conversations. It'll be work that we do probably vertically across our schools. Um, in, in addition, you know, I, I think it's gonna, be, it's gonna be absolutely exciting to talk about um, internship programs for my seniors and how to make that work with our schedule. Um, and um, a world where we can talk about one and two day job shadowing programs for our juniors so they can start to explore what their future may be like. Um, the creation of um, student led groups. And we, we, we do have something that's, um, that's getting off the ground right now that are focusing on bias and social justice related situations that are occurring in our communities. Um, we're also looking to see um, in regards to um, it, it, for us tr transition you know, what would, you know, what can we do to, um, you know, what are our health protocols gonna look like next year? You know, I, I, we, are we in masks? How does that impact us? Um, and in some of, some of the challenges that come with going back into in-person learning. So um, I, I am excited. Um, it is um, very, very challenging, but I, I can't tell you that there's another place I would rather be. So um, I'm, I'm very, very blessed and lucky to be with you guys tonight. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Any comments or questions, Mr. Longchamp? So uh, through the chair, is it going to be Justin Bieber that you're dancing to or Led Zeppelin? <laughs> I don't think he heard me. Well, I, I don't know if I can hear you. I'm so sorry. Are you dancing to Justin Bieber or Led Zeppelin for... Oh. <laughs> Um, I really can't even pronounce the name of the band or what it is. Uh, I was told it's the Timber song. I don't know what that, if that means anything to any of you. Timber. Nobody wants to see this. It's, um, <laughs> oh, yes, we do. <laughs> That'll be added to the academic highlights. We'll, fi we'll, finish, I, we'll finish with that. I heard he was going to be all over TikTok. <laughs> uh, I, sure, I sure hope not. My third grade. 
I love the postcard idea. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. that was a that's good idea. Great. Wasn't yeah. It? Yeah, and I, I think it. It, it, I thought it was particularly meaningful because it was all designed by students and um, students voted on the postcards. You know, we didn't create a script. It was their words. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to put together something each month and some activities and with, with some themes. And um, I, I know it's not the same as what they, what they want or what they're used to, but um, like I mentioned in my snapshot, I, I can't begin to tell you just how grateful they are with just to be able to do some of these things that we've, um, some of these experiences that we've created. Mr. DeLongchamp, uh, welcome aboard. It sound, sounds like you've made some friends over at the high school, not with um, just staff and faculty, but with the students as well. It sounds like they've, they've really welcomed you. And um, as, as you say, you know, you're, you're lucky to be back here and happy to be back. I, I think we're just as lucky to have you. So um, welcome back. And, and especially under the circumstances, um, you seem to really be, be pulling it off well. Um, as are all, all of our leadership and all of our teachers and all of our staff around the district. But um, it, it sounds like even with everything going on, um, you've made the best of it. You're happy to be here. And I just want to say we're, we're happy to have you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And thanks Thank for the you. report. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, so that uh, concludes uh, kind of the reports from the principals. Uh, as I said at the outset of the evening, um, you know, the theme is response and recovery, and I think this evening you heard a lot about how we're responding and how we're starting to plan what our recovery will look like in fiscal year 22. Uh, you saw numerous connections to our mission, our vision, and our core values. Um, you know, our accomplishments, you know, both this year and, and what we'll, we anticipate to be doing in the future, I think, is a true representation of our commitment to rise from this stronger than before. Uh, and I think you heard that, you know, from people this evening in terms of just how they're looking at their own practices um, and, and the growth that they're seeing in their buildings, both with teachers and with students. Um, again, you know, as, as stated, um, our classroom supply lines are level funded, uh, realizing the fiscal challenges before us in 22. Um, again, those are attached to the presentation if people are interested at home to look at those. Um, I will address them again uh, January 6th, just in terms of totals and what percentage that does comprise of the, the fiscal year 22 budget. Um, there are no new positions, again, as I said at the outset, unless we have an emergency, um, you know, and, and of course we would, we would look to, to remedy that. Um, and then January 6th, again, as I said, I've already said, uh, will be the fiscal year 22 presentation, part two, um, where we'll talk about really kind of the nuts and bolts of, of all the financing. Um, and then we'll, we'll have a, a draft budget number for you to, to look at and, and hopefully approve to send forward to the town manager. But um, I would like to just uh, say uh, thank you to um, the entire leadership team, Dr. Chamberlain. Um, the work that, that they are doing um, is, is heroic. Uh, as someone said tonight of our teachers, um, the amount of hours, uh, the days um, are long. Uh, the weeks don't end, they just, it's the next day, um, and we've been going strong since July 1st, and uh, I couldn't be more proud of the work that they've done and will continue to do on behalf of our, our kids um, and, uh, and our town, and I'm just, um, I'm, I'm very blessed to, uh, to be able to, to lead them um, and, and work with them every day, so um, thank you very, very much. You don't hear it enough, um, as I said to you this morning in, in our admin meeting, but um, I wanted to, you know, say it publicly, so... Thank you for taking the time tonight. Thank you for supporting each other. And um, uh, it's 10 after 8. I think you're probably free to sign off. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. We'll be right Thank back you. at it tomorrow. Good night. Good night, everybody. Night. Thank you. Bye-bye. We are blessed with an amazing team. Really impressed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's not like that everywhere. No. All right, so moving on, winter sports update. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So included in your packets tonight um, are a couple of things. Uh, one is a letter from the Southern Worcester County principals uh, regarding the 2020 winter sports season. Um, that letter was drafted at the conclusion of a joint meeting of superintendents and principals uh, last Monday, December the 1st. 
uh, I think as, as many of you know, winter sports were scheduled to start December 14th. Um, however, as a result of COVID transmission, transmission concerns with both basketball and hockey in particular, um, it was decided that if uh, a winter sports season would happen, that it would not start in any form until January the 4th. Um, although the eight of the 13 superintendents participated in a straw poll, um, eight elected at that time not to have winter athletics based on the information available to us. Um, we did decide as a, as a collective in the Southern Worcester County uh, to push that final decision out a few weeks and to watch the trajectory of the virus and uh, to discuss this with our school committees. Um, you know, as you might imagine, this is a, a, a you know, a contentious subject. Um, everybody, you know, enjoys their athletics. Uh, I think for me, where I stand on this right now, as I've noted in my report to you, is I, at this time, I do not support a winter sports season. Um, and very plainly as stated here, um, due to, you know, safety concerns that I have um, and the potential ramifications within the school community, should we have one or more positive cases. Um, you know, what I was, I was very hesitant to even go into the fall season um, because of similar concerns. And we did um, come out of the fall season um, relatively unscathed. I will say that we did have um, a fairly major uh, issue avoided um, with uh, one athletic team. Um, and if not for, I think, the um, amazing uh, screening tools and precautions that we have in place as a district, we could have had a disaster on our hands. Um, and, and as it was, it, it still didn't turn out well for the, the 50 some odd uh, students, uh, student athletes, um, and the coaches uh, who were also employees who had to miss substantial time out of school. Um, you know, we were, as I said here in my, in my report that I, I wrote to you last week, um, you know, we, we were electing to push it out a few weeks to just, you know, kind of hope against hope that maybe something turns. Um, I have to say where we, we have a, a hockey program and a basketball program, hockey kind of puts us in a bit of a unique situation because we co-op with about seven schools um, all, over, all over Worcester County on the girls' side, and we co-op with roughly, I think, four teams on the boys' side. Uh, where we are, um, you know, now, uh, with rising COVID cases um, and where we are now with really, truly a struggle to keep our buildings open every day. Um, you know, I, I can't in good conscience say that I, I think this is a great idea. Uh, I respect immensely the work done at the MIAA, um, done by the medical committee. Uh, also shared with you tonight is an email from a, a concerned parent relative to hockey and the safety uh, that they have enjoyed um, in a junior program. And I've had numerous conversations with, with that person over the last couple of days. Um, I also had email exchanges with, with two other individuals who were fairly in the know with respect to what's going on you know, at the MIAA uh, as it relates to, to medical. Um, and as I explained uh, in all three occasions, and, I, and I'll explain tonight, my reasoning, you know, really is it, we can plan to do anything, right, um, under the assumption that everybody is going to do everything the way that ne it needs to be done in order for things to happen safely. Um, anything. And so when we look at the medical advice from the MIAA, absolutely. When I look at that from a basketball standpoint, from a hockey standpoint, I say, absolutely, sure. But that's taking a pretty big assumption that everybody is going to do what needs to be done, not inside, but outside. And for us, at least as a public school district, the picture is much broader than can you do it safely medically. It's when something happens, because it will happen, it has demonstrated itself to have happened in the fall. What type of fallout does that then create within the public schools that then makes it really logistically a challenge and, a, and an additional stressor on our resources to keep our schools open and going and moving forward? There are, I respect, you know, everyone that I have spoken to immensely. 
there are compelling cases to be made on both sides of this issue. I just can't come down in good conscience as the superintendent of the school district and say, I think this makes sense. Um, there is discussion around the state, um, as, as you probably are hearing um, and seeing, uh, where um, people have different opinions. And, and I respect those opinions. There are some school districts that are, that are in, in leagues that are, that are moving ahead. Um, I can tell you that there were conversations behind the scenes that people wouldn't be privy to you know, locally, as I stated here, where um, you know straw polls were eight four one, you know to to not have to not have winter athletics. Um, that could change. Uh, the caveat from some of the superintendents was that could change, based on input from the school committee. So then you get into the debate about you know is it a school committee decision? Is it a, is it what is it? Um, I, I'm not really interested in getting into that debate. I'm interested in being collaborative and just letting you know where I stand right now on the issue. I value your input as a committee um, and look forward to hearing it. And, um, you know, in some communities, the school committee says to the superintendent, no, we're having athletics. That's fine. You know, I mean, it, it's, it is what it is. Um, I'm just, I'm giving you the update, my recommendation this evening, um, and again, you know, in, in, in full recognition that I have tremendous respect for the MIAA, for the work they've done, for the individuals that I've spoken to, the, the email that you have, um, you know, in your possession, tremendous respect, um, you know, for that individual and uh, the conversations that we've had. I, I, I just cannot bring myself to a place to say I think it's a good idea. Um, and I've just not been a herd mentality guy either. You know, there are a lot of people that are you know, can be swayed by public opinion and, and pressure. And this is a circumstance where I just, I, I, I can't. Um, I, I, I can't in good conscience say I think it's a good idea. So um, that's where we are right now. I see Mr. Davis is still on the call. Um, I think he's paying attention. Mr. Davis, are you with us? <laughs> You're on mute. Oh, okay, sorry. I just turned my head and I saw you, so I was just making, I was just making sure. Yeah. Okay. No, I I just think, do you have any? I mean, do you have anything to add? Uh, I, I, you know, I didn't anticipate you staying, but I'm glad had to have you. No, I, you know, has has the director of athletics? I mean, it's awful tough for me to say uh, about the safetyness of, you know, I, I agree with Casey. I mean, I, I look at this, and uh, I, I don't think anybody wants to see athletics probably as much as I do. Um, and the best part of my job is watching our kids compete. But in my gut feeling, I also want them to be in a safe environment while they're competing. And that's the part that I really, really struggle with. So um, I know it's tough, but I, I, I see a lot more negatives than I do positives throughout this whole situation. So. Thank I wish it was different, believe me. Yeah, us too. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, I, w I would just add that um, I have a great deal of respect um, for all the individuals involved, j just as you do, Mr. Hanfield, and, and including um, the, the emails that, that I just saw this evening. Um, I, I've coached with these people. I'm friendly with them. Um, and as Mr. Davis said, no one loves to watch sports um, as much as him. Well, I'm right up there, and I know you are as well, especially watching our own kids compete. Um, but, but I agree um, with a lot of what you said. Um, our, our core mission and responsibility here is, is to educate children. And as we talked about throughout some of the presentations tonight, the excitement that these these kids have for those two days that they're in school they cannot wait to get back to school um, as those those students had met, mentioned to uh, mr. Delonchamp when can we come back four days get us yeah. back into school four days now on, on the flip side the girls were thankful that they got to play field hockey I just don't want to see anything jeopardize the two days that we have right now and as you just said um, moments ago um, we've been in jeopardy of possibly having to close um, one or two of our schools at any given time because of quarantining or because of um, positive um, 
COVID results. Yeah, you know, whatever it might be, and I know, and I know we've been teetering, and, and the numbers are way up right now, and, and it seems like people around me, friends around town, um, and I, most of them, my friends, because of athletics. I'm not saying it has anything to do with athletics, um, but people are coming up positive, and it's affecting one, one or two people, five people, a dozen people um, every time they quarantine, and we have that new chart now that speaks to that. Um, again, I go back to what our core mission is, um, and, and, and that's education. I understand what sports, what the arts, what everything does for the, for the um, social and emotional well-being of our students, but I don't think it pales in comparison to what, how they would feel if they had to go fully remote again, which that, that may happen anyway, but I think we need to do anything we can to avoid that. And I think avoiding that means not involving ourselves in sports with especially other towns. Um, and uh, one town could go in the red, and, and that could happen after we just, we just had a sporting event with them. You just don't know how that's going to play out. And the other thing is I see how hard, as a district, um, all of you are working just to keep this ship afloat daily. So this is just an additional layer. And, and again, it hurts me to say this. I, I love sports. I love seeing kids play sports. I know what it means to them. Um, it's really a great outlet for them, especially with what, what's going on. But this is an additional um, layer to what you are going to have to concentrate, your staff is going to have to concentrate on every day. From, from transportation to that one positive, um, that, that one positive test result that, that, that you have to trace and, and, and get the Board of Health involved and the nurses, that's taking them away from something else that, that they could be doing. So my concern is the trickle-down effect, and we've seen it happen, as you said, in the fall. We, we, we almost, uh, you know, we almost had the train off the rails there um, b because someone didn't do the right thing. And and I respect again. I respect um, what, what what the experts are saying. I respect what these parents are saying. It's um, I'm sure some organizations are doing a great job, and I see that happening. But what are these what are these children doing? What are these parents doing when they leave there? We don't know. Um, maybe maybe they're lucky that they've had the numbers that they've had, and um, I credit them for. Um, for the safety measures they put in place, but nothing is foolproof. And anything that jeopardizes um, my child or every child in the district from getting that two days a weekend that they're getting right now and that hopefulness that they're going to get the four days, you know, I'm, I'm against that. And I hate to say it like that, I'm against it. I'm never, I've never been against anything sports in my life. But I'm against jeopardizing um, what, what we have right now, the little that we have right now. You know, and I, and I think, too, uh, you know, it, it's a circumstance where, you know, we're at a flashpoint, you know, with this. And, and, and you know, I think when you look at things um, big picture, I think when you look at, you know, the governor's step yesterday of rolling us back to, you know, to phase three, you know, uh, section one, um, you know, numbers are increasing by the day, and, and they're piling up. We reported five in the district today, um, and, and so then you, so you think about it from that standpoint. And so in the fall, cases were lower, open air, certain you know certain things that were in place that gave me a, 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 a bit more comfort, knowing full well that at any time you can go off the rails. Now, the circumstance that we had in the fall child didn't willingly or, or knowingly come, you know, uh, COVID positive, no. but he did. And the result and followed from that, um, you know, was, was, was very concerning, uh, very concerning. And, um, and, and, and what went on behind the scenes to then what those families then had to go through with getting tested, some of them having to stay out of school for two weeks, the fear it put into families because they weren't certain if, if, you know, their child may have been exposed and the exposure that they had then had with other relatives. Um, you know, those are all, those are the deeper parts of this 
that I think go beyond just the logistics of school. You start digging deeper into, you know, the what ifs. And, and, and I don't like to always get hung up in the what ifs, but you also can't deny, I think, the seriousness of what we're doing. And, you know, we don't have trend analysis on something like this, right? Um, we haven't seen situations. You know, people are telling us, well, again, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, and everything's great. It's great until it isn't, mm -hmm. you know? And that's what ran through my head back in the fall. Um, and I will tell you, uh, you know, in the conversations uh, that, I, that I had in the last few days, you know, my thinking was challenged, you know? And, and, and I, you know, in follow-up conversations again today, um, I, but I just kept coming back to the same place that this is this is broader than what the MIAA says it's safe to do. Um, if it's the MIAA thinks it's safe to do, why is the MIAA not hosting postseason tournaments? Why did they totally just kick it back into districts' laps, and now they're putting it on us to make those decisions? And again, I respect them. I respect them. And I respect every person who sat in that those committees and made these recommendations. But in this current climate, you know, looking at things in totality, it, it just is not a recommendation that I can make that I think makes good sense. Um, and, and that's looking at it from, from multiple lenses. And, and yeah, and I get it too. You know, I have a daughter who's a Division One athlete, you know, who has lost two athletic seasons because of COVID. I get it. I get it on that level. Um, you know, I, I, I get the disparity, you know, that, that may come up and say, well, why is that community doing it and we're not? I get that. I, I can't speak to those communities. I can only speak to what we're doing here in Auburn, and that's my primary concern. Um, and, you know, there'll be people that will respectfully disagree with my statement and my position on this, but, you know, it, it, I, I sat here in February and said to you, and as a matter of fact, Gail, I said it to you, that safety was my number one concern above all else, right? And if I feel that that's compromised in any way, shape, or form, even for one child, I cannot in good conscience recommend that we do this. Um, I don't want to be the test case to have something happen. I don't want to be the test case to see something serious happen. I don't want to be having to chase down seven other school districts, potentially, who may or may not have the precautions in place that we have. Because then you don't know who's on first, you know, and it's the same thing, you know, and, 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 and if I look at basketball, I, you know, I play basketball. I mean, I, I just, I think we all have at one point. I just don't know how that makes any sense. And again, I guess if in a, in a perfect world and everybody did what they were supposed to do, okay. But as I said, we know people aren't. Yes. Yeah. Because if, if that was the case, the governor wouldn't be at the podium every day. He wouldn't have rolled people back. We wouldn't be scrambling to cover buildings. We wouldn't be pleading with families to tell us who was at their birthday party because you had a COVID-positive kid uh, or an overnight sleepover or the other things that are going on. Yeah. And again, you know, I appreciate and respect people's decisions and the actions that they take. And I get COVID has been long and hard. Uh, on people, and so I, my comments are not in any way, shape, or form meant to be taken as disrespectful to them. I'm just saying that this is the reality within which we're living, and we have to be cognizant of it. And until behavior changes, some of these things we have to swallow hard so we can start doing some of these things again. And, and, and I don't think, you know, sitting here and saying I think we should do athletics, I don't think that helps, helps what we're doing. Casey, through the chair for me. I agree with you 100%. I mean, uh, Coach Davis even spoke to how the coaches check on the academics of their students before maybe they can play or not, because that's, that's where the focus is, academics. And all of sports and all of that are wonderful. I mean, I played sports as lousy as I might have been, but <laughs> way back when. But it was something you did. But first of all, you were a student. And I can't catch can't help thinking here that if the professional teams can't keep their players safe, how are we going to do it? Right. And we don't have that kind of control over them. So uh, I think until things get better, the weather, they can play outside, I'm 100% behind you. 
I mean, I think through the chair, the hospitals aren't letting visitors in. I know someone last week, her husband couldn't be with her when she found out the gender of her babies during the ultrasound. And so I can't in good conscience at this point, if people are in the hospital by themselves, you know, all these restrictions are getting into place. How, how can we vote to say, okay, go play basketball at this point? And I have to say, having Coach Davis here definitely helps. I'm glad that we're kind of all on the same page. And I, I mean, the hockey, the girls' hockey team in Auburn, I know the people behind putting that together and the hard work they put into it. And, um, you know, awful. I, and I know what sports do for kids, and I hope we can get it back as soon as possible. But tonight, I, there's no way I could vote for that. I concur mm -hmm. through the chair. I, I agree as well with Coach Davis and with Superintendent that we we need to just ride this out, and we need to keep our eyes on the prize. And that right now, education is a you know to the the director of the CDC. They're saying and you know Dr. Fauci. They're all saying we are going into our darkest days, and even our fall sports season started when our uh, COVID load in town was much, much lower. And we still had some pretty severe, you know, we had some pretty severe pot or potentially severe outbreaks. So thank goodness, you know, they did not come to fruition. But, uh, you know, I think it is absolutely the, the right call. I think we have to do what's best for our town and we have to listen to our own conscience on this. And um, I, you, I have your back 100% on this. I agree. Yeah, and through the chair, um, I think at this point, anything that puts more strain on our faculty and the teachers and you guys, I just absolutely cannot support that. So I think no matter what it is, you know, and um, does this, so we're not even talking about cheer and the indoor track yet, right? The February stuff. No, so, so the fall two season, as, as uh, Mr. Davis stated, is, is slated to start at the end of February. You know, I don't want to put the cart before the horse there um, because I, you know, I, I am certainly willing to see how things materialize over the, over the coming months. You know, but if we look at the patterns of what happened, what's happened post Thanksgiving, and, you know, we, um, you know, look at Christmas and New Year's and then what the potential could be, you know, mid January. See, that's the other part of it, too. I mean, I, I, I can't, it doesn't make any sense to me seeing what we've seen. Post Thanksgiving, yeah, not even just in the co the COVID positive cases, but the dozens that we're watching, that could turn into to COVID positive cases, to then add another layer of of potential, you know, um, hardship to the to the district. I, I just I, it, it just doesn't make any sense, and and you know. I struggle with this immensely. Uh, you know, Beth and I, we've, we've, we've talked about this a number of times. I've talked about it, you know, endlessly, among other things, with, with Mr. Davis and Mr. DeLongchamp. Um, you know, and, and you know, I, I've probably given more thought to this than maybe it merits, but, you know, but for it's about our kids, I've given it that thought. And I, I just cannot come back to a place where I can say I think it makes sense. And so that, I mean, that's just where we are now. Um, and, you know, I was in favor of, of kicking it down the road, but now we're starting to get inquiries from uh, schools that are co-oping with us on the hockey side. Um, we're getting questions about ice time and, you know, people want to know schedules. And, you know, I, I, I'm not, as I think more about this, I'm, I'm just not certain uh, at all. As a matter of fact, I think I'm probably convinced, to be quite honest, nothing is going to change that no. would sway sway this between now and the end of December. Things are just getting worse. Yeah, and it, like I said, I, I, it, it pains me greatly um, to be having this conversation. Um, but I just, you know, and I knew it was coming. I, I knew this was going to, this is where we were going to come to in mid-November, and I, I was hoping that things would, would be turning a different way, but they're not. You know, and, Jerry, and just have to say it stinks that they're putting this in our lap as a district. Yeah, it's you know they could have really. scheduled things differently at the state level mm -hmm. and given these kids a season later on. But yeah, and I mean you know the other part of it too is that as you know Beth and I sit in through the chairs as Beth and I you know talk about this and, and whatever and you know I appreciate the lenses people look through. You know I, as a parent I can appreciate a parent's perspective. 
I am one with, with two athletes, one with a, a very high-powered athlete. Um, I, I can look at this through the lens of a coach. I mean, I coached for, for years on the, on the youth and high school levels. Um, so I understand that part of it, too. Um, I'm now looking at it through the lens of, of you know, a, a school superintendent you know, responsible for the safety and welfare of 2,400 kids who are currently in our building, sure. plus our faculty and staff. And, you know, there are compelling arguments to, arguments to be made about why you should go ahead and let it go. Um, but it, 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 in my mind, it, it, it doesn't tip, you know, all the reasons why I don't think it should happen. Um, and, and that's unfortunately, you know, for, for those people that this, you know, my position is, is disappointing, that that's where I am. So, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to bring it to you. I wanted to have this discussion. I, you know, I know in some communities, the discussions are going different ways. Superintendents are coming out, you know, with a certain position, and school committees are saying, no, nope, we're having athletics. And if that was the posture of the committee, then that's the posture of the committee. And as I said to, to someone earlier today, you know, I, I just as long as I make my feelings, you know, known and how I feel, um, you know, w whatever happens after that happens after that. But I think it's the right decision, um, and I appreciate your support um, in that. I certainly would have respected you, um, you know, your opinions if they were different. Um, but I was, I was uncomfortable uh, with the fall uh, to start, and um, you know, for for some of the things that did happen in the fall, and and the other thing that's difficult too is, you know, people don't see the behind the scenes. They just don't see it. There's so much that goes into getting our schools open, and you know. I, you know, we talk with other area districts and, and, and the, the things that have gone on behind the scenes in their districts in terms of potential COVID positives, COVID positives, unknown COVID positives that have now become known, um, the quarantining that then takes place, um, you know, the having to track down another school because they're a member district, you know, co-oping with you. It, it just, it, it, there's just nothing that, that, that comes, comes good out of it. And, um, so I don't I mean, want to even the strain it would put on our school nurses because they are the yeah. ones conducting all of this research <laughs> every day. Yeah. Um, yep. I mean, they would just cringe. I can picture them now all cringing if we said yes to, you know, winter sports. So. Okay. The, the, the thing about our Board of Health, they're terrific. And you heard a number of times, you know, our Board of Health being cited tonight and, and lauded inappropriately. So Darlene and, and Eileen, they, they just do a fantastic job. Um, Unlike some boards of health, they're not going to come in and tell you not to do something. They're going to give you their advice. And as a school district, if you decided to move forward with it, they were going to figure out how to best help support you do it safely. Um, and, and that was the case mm -hmm. here. But, you know, you could kind of see, you know, the cringes, <coughs> you know, in their eyes when you just, when you mention it. And in other area boards of health, they're the same thing. They're, they're telling districts, uh, we don't think so, you know, so. We've had we, we've had students um, lose some pretty valuable seasons um, early on when we had to cancel, you know, varsity baseball in the spring and, and, and other varsity sports, and and that was terrible. And, and canceling the play, I felt terrible when we had to make that decision. But I'll tell you, when we decided to hold um, the the concert. The, the winter concert, whatever it was, right and that was right when news reports were coming out. We held it the next day, everything blew up. I think I felt much worse about that, the possibility that we put that many people in danger. That was just a terrible feeling the next day, and people said, I can't believe you guys held that concert. Mm -hmm. Well, that was right out of the gate. I didn't take it as serious as maybe I should have. But I'll tell you, that was a terrible feeling. So, so you have to you have to weigh the the worst case scenarios here. Worst case scenario, if we don't have a second fall sports season, um, w whatever it is that we're, we're calling, whether it's it's hockey, basketball. Worst case scenario, these kids are missing out on a little bit. They're missing out on their you know their their, their freshman year, their sophomore year, wh whatever year that it, it may be. Um, Seniors, I feel terrible for them as I did, you know, back in the spring. That's the worst case scenario. They're they're missing out on a season. Worst case scenario, if things blow up inside the schools because of the some sort of a an outbreak that may have come from another town, it's it could be a tragedy. 
that, that's on us, you know, and I'm, I'm comfortable making this decision because of that. I don't want to be responsible for one person missing school, never mind someone becoming deathly ill, not being able to see their family, you know. Losing loved ones. Lo losing <laughs> yeah. loved ones, not, not being able to visit them in the hospital, as you say. Yeah. So worst case scenario, if they don't get to play, it's terrible. I feel bad for the kids. The parents are going to feel terrible for the kids. Um, we, we don't take this lightly, but the, the worst case scenario on, on the other side can be much worse. And as far as pushing it off and waiting to see what, what other schools are doing, um, I think we owe it to our families. Um, I know there was at least one, one email that you know someone was just interested in finding out. If it's not going to happen, we'd, we'd like to know so we can plan accordingly. I'm sure there are a lot of families like that. And from reading um, th this one email, it sounds like that's a, a great organization that, that they're a part of. And maybe there are others out there that you know have those safety protocols. Um, I'm not 100% confident in that. But, um, but if, that's, if there is a place for them to go and play, let's, let's just make the decision now so that they can um, look into other options. That's, that's the way I look at it. Why wait for surrounding towns to make their decisions? I, I would gather that if a decision is made in Auburn, and that's not the reason I'm doing it, but if a decision is made in Auburn, Others are going to follow suit, and that's not. And I'm not looking to be the Pied Piper here. I'm just saying I think other uh, other other districts are looking for that. Yeah. I, I would agree with you. Um, uh, I agree too. I, I would I would agree with you. I, I I think, you know, one of the things about public life is it's it's incredibly demanding, and you are you know um, you are a lightning rod. Or a decision that you make, um, especially when it's not a decision people want, mm. or one that's popular, and I think that's some of the the, the the paralysis that is, you know, kind of taking over the state, you know, in, in school committees and school districts. In their bellies, they realize, yeah, this doesn't really feel good, but. Do I want to listen to the 45 people I'm going to get stopped by at the gas station or the mall or the grocery store? Do I want to get the tomatoes thrown at me through the email? <laughs> Things like that. But I think, you know what, you're right. It, it, it's going to take somebody to step up and say, listen, we're not, we're not doing it, and, and this is why, and, and we're okay with it. Um, and, and I think you're exactly right. I think, I think people are waiting for the dominoes to kind of start falling. Um, you know, so I, you know. Yeah, we'll take a beating for this one. But do you need a vote from us or anything? <laughs> yeah. No, I we no. I mean, technically, no. Um, this this is this is something that's operational. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not it's not something within the purview of the committee. But you know, I don't operate that way. Um, I, I want to be as inclusive as possible. Um, in some communities, you know, um, committees operate differently, and you know kind of um, impose their will on the superintendent around issues where it is in collaboration and uh, athletics is, is probably one of the very top issues, um, you know, around that. So I just wanted to make sure that, you know, my, where I feel or, or how I feel, how Beth and I feel, how Mr. Davis and Beth and I feel and Mr. DeLongchamp as well and, mm -hmm. and others, um, to make sure that we're on the same page and that if you, if, if you weren't feeling that way, that we have that conversation and open session, and so everybody knows where we stand and why we stand that way, and then figure out what we do moving forward. Um, so, I, I, you know, through the through the chair, I think the chair's comments are 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 right on point. I think to give families an opportunity now to say, look, it, we don't need to see another few weeks based on what's happened in the last week and what's projected to be happening. Yeah. And then if we want to give families the right, they absolutely have the right to go and, and, and seek alternate uh, activity, um, you know, that we give them ample time to do that. Um, and, and hopefully things turn around and, and we can, you know, maybe look at a fall two season at the end of February. Yeah. That would be the best case scenario. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. A glimmer of hope. I'm yeah. just not seeing any glimmers right now. No. Okay. no. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I will. Uh, I will take. Um, I will take everyone's input.
Uh, I will um, circle up with Mr. Davis and Mr. DeLongchamp uh, tomorrow, and um, we'll wrap up what we need to wrap up on our end and let schools and families know. Okay, on another note, it was in the paper today, uh, do we have to say anything about go switching to playing with Lester? <laughs> no. No? We don't, and I will, so, <laughs> I, can see, I can see Mr. Davis smiling over there, too. Because I'm this, all this, for it. This is, well, I mean, whatever, it's quarter now, why not? Um, <laughs> we only have one more thing on the agenda. So, you know, I, I mean, the, the, the Telegram and Gazette's uh, article this morning, um, or it actually broke last evening, but... Yeah, um, right. as, I, as I had let you know, I was tipped off to the article being printed last night um, relative to um, a Lester Auburn um, kind of beginning a new rivalry. And I have to tell you, um, it was, it, it truly, uh, and I know that I'm, you know, I know Superintendent Tenza, you know, her comments I think were taken out of context um, because, you know, we didn't go looking, you know, for another Thanksgiving Day opponent. No. Um, as, as the newspaper correctly indicated, Oxford dropped us in 2012, I believe, um, because they were struggling as a, as a program, and they just felt it wasn't in their best interest to play us anymore. And that was after, oh gosh, I don't know, 30 some I mean, yeah, a long time. Yeah, forever. Mm -hmm. And so we had to grin and bear it, and we were told late. Um, and so that sent us on a trajectory for the last eight years of early on we had to scramble and we played Northeast Metro Vocational Technical High School, say that five times fast, <laughs> um, in Wakefield because they were the only uh, building that was uh, without a game. We played them on a, I think on a two-year stint and then um, we then joined up with Holy Name uh, for the last five or six years and with Holy Name and St. Peter's merging into St. Paul's, they Holy Name already had a, excuse me, St. Peter Marion already had in a, a, a long and storied rivalry with St. John's. So St. Paul's, can, the new Holy Name in St. Peter, St. Paul's, is now moving and staying with St. John's. So that left us without an opponent. So, um, you know, there was a lot of good vibe um, back with the Tarantino game um, mm -hmm. that fall, um, after, unfortunately after Ron's death. And, you know, we, there were, I wouldn't say discussions, I would just say there, were, there was talk. You know, we've played Lester on and off, you know, in the last several years, we're in different divisions. Um, but, you know, there was talk about making that an annual event and making it a community event where, you know, we do enjoy um, a, 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 a very nice relationship, you know, with, uh, you know, the Lester Public Schools. Um, we also have a lot of community ties. Mm -hmm. With, with the Leicester Public Schools, um, our police departments, I mean, I, just everybody. Yeah, I mean, there's just, yeah. there's a lot of community there. Um, and not to say that that's not the case between Prouty and Leicester. It absolutely is. Um, but whatever the business was, you know, out, out there on, on Breezy Bend, they had their 50th anniversary last year of, of playing each other. And, um, you know, it was, it was of Leicester's mindset that, you know, maybe it was time to move on. And um, so... You know, we did have an open date. It, it made sense to us. And so I did speak in Mr. Davis's office to Superintendent Tenza. She called to see if we were still, you know, interested in doing something. And I affirmed that for her, you know, in the phone call, that if they were available, you know, we didn't have a date. And so we'd be happy to, you know, uh, entertain the, um, you know, the, the offer, you know, if in fact that's what it was. I feel badly that it's messy out there. Um, I do. Um, I think the paper indicated that it's messy, you know, between the two districts, and and I get it. You know, we went through it with Oxford, um, but I think in the end, I think it, it will be the best thing for all the communities involved. Um, you know, but I, I, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, I, you know, I mean, it, it's not totally, totally done, but it's you know, 99% done. They're in the process out there of of speaking between the two districts and, and, and settling that issue. So, but I, unless something drastically changes, um, yeah, I would expect that we'll be, we'll be facing the West of Wolverines on Thanksgiving. That's great. So. Excellent. Yeah. It's good for us. Any yeah. further commentary on that? Yeah. So that will be your decision? On what? On going with Lester or well how does you know that come it, about? It, yeah so it's interesting you know the genesis of these things I mean if this was Auburn Alabama 
Um, I would say that the superintendents, you know, probably are the ones that, you know, do, <laughs> do these things. <laughs> but it's not truly just not how it is. I mean, the, uh, on the high school level, the principals and the ADs, they work out their schedules. Oh. Um, and then, you know, it is what it is. You know, it's just, um, we, you know, we have cursory discussion about it, but, you know, we don't ever really get involved in it. Um, but like I said, I think this is just, you know, there's a lot of connections there. Um, you know, Tom Lauder is right. on the school committee there. You and know. he oh, was yes. in our district for yeah. a long time. He was. He was. He was also yeah. my, um, yeah. he was also my, my head football coach uh, when I played in Auburn. Right. Oh, um, he was my brother's too. Yeah. Lester's yeah. Uh, head coach was, was our, offens our offensive coordinator. So, I mean, there are connections there. Oh, yeah. You know, and like I said, it, it just, and they just keep going and going and going. So. Um, you know, like I said, I, I know what it feels like to, you know, to be, to be left at, <laughs> well, I shouldn't say left at the altar, maybe left at the courthouse, um, <laughs> as, as the case may be, um, as it was in Oxford, because um, yeah. that was a hard pill to swallow, and I get it, but you mm -hmm. know what, when we look back on it now, you know, 10 years later, it was the best thing for both of us. Yeah. Um, Oxford, you know, has, has improved their program, and they're doing good things there. We just, we just, we tried to reconnect with them for Thanksgiving to bring it back, but we, we just, we couldn't make it work. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. I, I you know, it, it, and that just again speaks to just, you know, kind of the emotions that athletics brings out in people. You know, yeah. and, um, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but but it's definitely a, it's a hot button topic. So, so I, yeah, I mean, it'll be left to to uh, Mr. Davis and uh, Mr. DeLongchamp to to wrap up. So. Great. Okay. Excellent. Well, good yeah. luck with that. Absolutely. I think it's going to work out great. Yeah. yeah. Again, I, I, I feel bad that, you know, they're Proudy and Lester are um, not in agreement with this, but, yeah, yeah it's, I think it is going to benefit Auburn. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right, yeah, moving on. Thing. Great. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, everybody. All right. We'll see you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Uh, and then just the, the final thing this evening, um, we, we have an acceptance of the French, uh, French River oil bid for t yeah. 22. Um, we solicit bids that we do every year um, for oil and things of that nature. And um, Peterson Oil uh, was the, the winner of the bid with a 1.69999 per gallon. Yeah, one way uh, down. Yeah, uh, we're down, all, uh, it's about 31 cents from, from last year. Oh, um, roughly, and so um, we will save about fourteen thousand um, dollars going into twenty-two. Wow! So that was that was good news for us. So um, where Ms. Wisbicki is serving as our representative at the town hall's kickoff tonight, oh. um, she asked that I present this to you, and um, you have to accept it um, unless you want to pay thirty cents more. Um, or you can find another <laughs> vendor. Um, I, w I would entertain that motion. I'll make the motion to accept the bid for fuel oil for FY22, which was awarded to Peterson Oil at a bid of $1.6999 per gallon. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 It is a vote. Hi, Dottie. I forgot that was over there. <laughs> all right. If there's nothing else. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make, make that motion. Do I have a second? A second. <laughs> Go ahead, Meg. <laughs> Don't fight over it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night. So is.